Audio Archives. So, uh, we wanted him to come back down to the club where he belonged, more or less. We had a brotherhood thing going, and uh, it's supposed to have been a hit time. Uh, I went up there to see about getting him to come back. I met this Charlie, and he was uh, just a maniac. I couldn't believe the guy. He has an uh, uh, attitude of killing all the police he sees and, and uh, getting all kinds of things around in his brain where he can beat the cops and has it all uh, all figured out where he's going to wind up being the uh, king of the, let's see, uh, uh, desert. He went out in the desert, Death Valley. Let me back up here a minute. Uh, you belong to which group? Satan uh, slaves? Space, the Space Satans. Are they tied up with the Satan slaves? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's uh, the Satan slaves in the valley and the straight Satans. Uh, yeah, that's valley. where I get most of my information now because I'm not riding with them anymore. Okay. So, are there any other motorcycle groups that ever went up there? Uh, no, those are the only two that I know of then. But, see, this is, this is a one percenter clique where it keeps all the clubs together instead of fighting amongst each other. What's a 1% clip? Well, 1% one percent is just a thing where, uh, like, you now there's a stray Satan, the Satan slaves, the Night Riders, the Question Marks, and the, uh, uh, several other different clubs all get together, and they put a 1% percent mark on them, you know, just 1%. And every time this guy sees that, that guy's different set of colors on his back, they don't hassle with him, they don't fight with him. It keeps everybody, from, you know, fighting each other. So, uh, that's more or less what that amounts to. I don't understand that. Everybody's got a one percenter as a brother, no matter what kind of patch they got on their back. Regardless of what club they belong to. Regardless of what club they belong to, as long as it's a one percenter, you get along with them. If you don't have the one percenter, then uh, if you buy yourself, somebody's going to thump your head. Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> so, for your knowledge, then, uh, as far as motorcycle groups that went up to Spawn Ranch, there's only two. Yeah, just now. Uh, our club, on one occasion, to get Danny to come back, and Danny himself stayed up there for, I'd say, approximately two or three weeks off and on, back and forth. He'd be back and forth and we had a meeting night Friday night and he never showed up for a meeting Friday night. So he was our club treasurer and uh, he said, well, we can't have this, you know, have a club treasurer and he's never here at meeting night or nothing. And uh, so we all went up there to get him. And it was uh, on the 15th, I believe, the night of the 15th, we went to get him and the 16th, the place was uh, a that bubbly place, right? That's August. Right, August. So I'd say uh, on August of Possibly the 10th or 11th. I went up there and I talked to Danny and I looked at him and flies all over the place and the people just like animals up there and I couldn't believe it, you know. See, our motorcycle club's pretty clean, really. That's not, some of the guys get pretty nasty, but I myself I like to keep things clean. I look at Danny laying down there all drunk and flies flying all over him and I can't have this because he's got his kid up there and everything else. Well, then comes this Charlie. He's a stone maniac. Well, he wanted Danny up there because Danny had his colors on his back. And all these rumpkins, they call them, come up there and start harassing the girls and messing with the guys. And Danny walks out there with his straight Satan colors on, his one percenter, and the slaves back him up and everything. Uh, nobody messes with Charlie, see. So Danny was his out for uh, not to get messed with. So uh, I try to get Danny to come back, and as Charlie's standing there, and uh, Charlie says, Now, oh, wait a minute. He says, uh, Maybe I can give you a better thing than you got already. I said, What's that? He says, Move up here. You can have all the girls you want. All the girls, he says, they're all yours. At, at your disposal of anything. And uh, he's a brainwashing type guy. So uh, after listening, trying trying to con me, I told him, I said, Charlie, you're crazy. You're full of shit, man. So I'm taking Danny back to town, and that's all there is to it. So I got Danny talked into going back to town almost, and, and Danny starts trying to talk me into staying up there. So uh, this Charlie's telling me how powerful he is, how strong he is. I said, well, how do you survive? How do you, uh, how do you support all these 20, 30 fucking bras, man? And he says, Oh, well, he says, I got them all hustling for me. He says, I go out at night and uh, he says, I do my thing. He says, well, what's your thing, man? You know, I says, let's get it together. I'll straight with you, you straight with me. I figured me being a motorcycle rider and all, uh, uh, I'd accept everything, including murder. I looked at the guy and he says, all right. He says, run your trip down. So he starts getting in my ear and he uh, says, uh, he goes up and he uh, goes to the rich people and he calls the police pigs and. Now he knocks on the door, 
still open the door. He'll just gyro on in with his cutlass and start cutting them off. See? This is what he told This is what he told me verbally, right to my face. Okay. Now, like I told the veterans person, I was talking to him. I'm, I met the guy on uh, three different occasions, and uh, I didn't have to do to put him away because he's, he's a homicide with me. I can just feel it. And I know it. And, uh, anyway, I says, you're kidding, Charlie. Is that what you really do? You know? He says, yeah. I says, uh, when's the last time you did it? He says, well, he says, we knocked off five of them. He says, just, uh, he told me the ninth. Well, this is right from his face. So, he told you on August the 9th. ninth. That came out of his right. Mouth. I got a lot more to go with it that's going to make it almost fit together. I think uh, you, can, uh, you guys got your kind of work, and you can find it out of your way, but uh, I think you'll be able to make a go of it. Charlie stated that he knocked over five people. Charlie and Tex. Okay. Now, I don't know Tex's full name. It says something, you know, I've got to get this together. Let me get this. Charlie stated. Charlie stated. Now, what that did he say verbatim? He had killed five. Now, I can't quite. Get the word up to what he used, like he calls policemen. You know, we kill five of the pigs, you know, and he calls rich people, like down in Hollywood and around that area, he calls them something else. Uh, I don't know what the word is he used, I can't think of it right now, but you know, either five of the rich people for their money or whatever. <coughs> uh, something like that. He didn't seem to get anything or something, I don't know what the trick was. He didn't, he didn't make a good goal. Excuse me, I've got to see the skipper at nine o'clock. Should be back in a couple of minutes. Okay. Let me just get some information, Charlie's name and all on here, and then we'll hold this off till you get back. How long are you going to be with the skipper? Just, just a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. What is it? It's Springer? Right. S P R I N G E R. And what's the first name? Al or Alan? Alan. A L N. Where can we get a hold of you, Al? I live out in Torrance, and uh, I haven't got a. Oh, yes, an address. I haven't got a phone number though. Is there anybody that we can talk, call to get a hold of you without putting any heat on you? Uh, let's see. Uh, Is there some gal that you see quite a bit? No, just my wife and kids. Okay, and they live with you? Yeah, all right. All right. Hmm. The reason I ask yeah. is we just assume not go down to your house and leave a card on the door, that kind of jazz, because that doesn't do anything for you. Uh, it doesn't really bother me either, but still, uh, it's quite a ways out there. I'm not home. For well, that's very no problem. Well, we can put a call on the Torrance PD and have a, somebody go out there. Yeah, all right. right. That's easily done. Well, what's your address out there then? Uh, let's see. I think it's 1551 Carson Street, Torrance. I just moved in there last week. And I Is that an apartment? No, it's a house. Okay. Moved in with a Call Carl Roland. Carl Roland? Carl Roland. R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Right. Okay, and you're, that's your, more or less your roommate, huh? Right. Uh, you can get a hold of me by calling, uh, let's see, International, this is, it's an international uh, Jeep sales on uh, Englewood Boulevard. This is where Carl works. Call him, uh, it's, an, it's a place where they sell new and used and repair international international harvester on Englewood Boulevard, right near the freeway, San Diego Freeway. They call Rollins there all the time. All right, we can call and leave word with him. Yeah, that's all. Uh, you want to see me? All right. Okay, this. What's the first day that you go up there again in August? It was either the 11th or the 12th. I'm not sure. Up there to get, I wanted to get the, yeah to get the car to come back. And I spent one night up there also. Spent one night in their place where they call Devil's Canyon. I rode my bike up there, took my sleeping bag, and went down in the canyon and looked at all their nudist colony bullshit and uh, watched them eat corn off their raw ear and they don't believe in eating meat and all this kind of bullshit. <laughs> was really out of hand. This Devil's Canyon, that's in Spawn Ranch, huh? Uh, it's to the, the Spawn Ranch is to the left of Topanga, and uh, Devil's Canyon is to the right of it, up in the hill away. The big old tree down there, the little creek bed. It's where Charlie done his thing with these younger girls that uh, were underage, more or less, you know, they're runaways or whatever. 
How many girls did you actually see? I saw about 15, 15 to 18 at one time. And they were the ones that were all of age. And the ones that were under age, you had them stashed up in the bushes. I think you got your man right here, I really do. Well, we, I'm pretty sure we have, but uh, in this day and age of feeding people their rights, uh, yeah. we're going to make a decent case on him. We can't do it with his statement. Uh, here again, we don't want to use your statement either. Well, see, I've got my theory on this, too. Uh, I don't really think Charlie himself is the one that uh, butchered these five. He told me that he had him and Tex and the fellow called Clem. Now, I can get their their uh, names and down pat, I think. Uh, Tex is Montgomery, I believe, or McGregor. Could be. I'll oh, know him in a minute. He took me right around and he stole a dune buggy. He's stolen radio on it and everything, you know. Looking at these guys, these guys are nuts, man. And uh, that's probably called Clem. He's a real flaky, real flaky dude. I think Clem and Tex did it. And wasn't there a mention of a blue Camaro? Well, we had a blue Camaro. Hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I couldn't get out of the skipper's office there. All right. Just to clue you on what's gone so far, we'll back up again. He's there on the 11th through the 12th, and he's in Devil's, there's a place called Devil's Canyon where he spent the night, and that's to the right of Topanga, and Spawn Ranch is on the other side of Topanga on the left. He sees 15 to 18 gals, they're all of age, and supposedly the there's another group of maybe 15, maybe 15 or so, no. underage, and Charlie keeps them stashed off in the bushes. Somewhere. They're all sitting around the campfire without a stitch of clothes on, just this colony. A little campfire going, passing corn around, eating it raw off the cob, and eating cheese out of the packages, and no meat involved. They didn't believe in eating meat. Charlie, uh, is he running around his birthday suit too? Uh, he runs around his birthday suit when he's down around the campfire, but uh, when he's up in the streets, he runs around in a leather leather pair of pants. Now, just about it, leather pair of pants and a pair of leather moccasins. Real mm -hmm. sneaky. He always he always creeps. You know, he's like a little Indian guy. Yeah, right. He is really a creepy too. <laughs> I was ready to beat him in the head with an iron pipe and myself up there, but I just knew better. Did Charlie tell you that he had 15 gals underage? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he says he's got them stashed. Yeah, right. So I've seen a few of them when I was down when I was down in the canyon. Uh, i see maybe about seven or eight of them I saw in the canyon. I would say was under, way underage. Now, at this time in August, you see... Perhaps Charlie's got 30 gals up there, and then there's Charlie. Right. How many guys are there? There was Charlie, let's see, there was Charlie, there was Tex, there was Clem, there was Shorty. Yeah. And put the shit to him. And uh, there was a little teeny kid, about maybe 11, 10, 11 years old, with real long hair, a little rumping kid, about this high. I don't know if you've ever seen him or not. No. And uh, uh, Danny was up there at the time, and uh, let's see, a fellow named Bruce, but Bruce might be one of these. Nick Bruce is Bruce McGregor. Yeah, Bruce McGregor. And uh, I guess there's a couple more, but I can't, I can't remember the place their names. Do you remember a guy named Tufts? Sounds familiar. Danny was telling me about something like that, and I don't recall hearing it up there on the farm. Okay, let's go back to this one first trip, and again, what we know is fact. So far, we have a statement Charlie made to you in which he stated that his thing was to go into town at night, he'd go to the home of some rich person, knock on the door, they open the door, he'd walk in with a knife, uh, he says he cut him up, and he got money from him. Right, well, you think was you going to rob them and get, get cold cash or, or something of value to sell quick or whatever to make his money. And then when he got all done, he, uh, I guess he got his nuts off by writing in blood on the wall. Uh, Did he make that statement? Oh, he you? made that statement that he wrote on either that wall or another wall of a different case that was also ran down to me. We'll get to that one later, too. That he uh, wrote something about the pigs on the wall and put a big paw, supposedly representing uh, the Black Panthers. So they're supposed to off the Black Panther up there, too. And, uh, okay. All these guys just blabbed all this shit down to me. I just sit there 
And it all falls back to Charlie, huh? This is what Charlie has said now. Yeah, this is exactly what Charlie said. Okay. What else has Charlie said exactly? <sighs> Charlie so far has said that he'd knock on the door and go in with a knife and cut up rich people and rob them. Uh -huh. Charlie says that he'd write on the wall with their blood. Yeah, right on the wall with their blood, uh, insinuating Black Panthers pulled it off, or, uh, or, uh, pigs, or, you'll get them, or something like that, you know. And he used a reference to pride. <clears throat> Do you think Charlie is a phony, a con type of guy who's trying to put you on and impress you this with... Is what, this is what my theory was at first. I thought, uh, that's why, uh, you know, to myself, I kept saying, uh, I wonder if he's just trying to really, really sock it to me and make me think that uh, if I go along with him, he'll back himself up on all this. And uh, I just shine him out. I didn't, think, I didn't believe that. Then all this bullshit started coming out in the papers and everything. I got to thinking. All up in that area and everything. <laughs> no good, you know. So uh, uh, I told him, I said, well, I says, you're not even a man. I said, you're a little creeping motherfucking mouse. I said, I'm going to beat your fucking brains in if you keep kind of Danny and staying up here. I said, wonder how that's all done. I said, just laugh and not even walk away from where we get through beating your ass, you know. He says, break his neck or something. I said, because if you'd done half of what you said you'd done, he says, you ain't even a man. And Danny's sitting there and he's agreeing with me. He says, you know, he's supposed to take his brother's word for anything in the club. Like, uh, almost right or wrong, you know, he's supposed to listen to me. And uh, out, of the four, out of the four guys in the club, I'm one of the officers in the club to try to keep all this bullshit down and keep it from getting out of hand. Uh, he, he was the ex-treasurer then because I was voted in, and uh, he listened to me. Got it, got it all together, and we went down to uh, the bar on the turbo, uh, the plank. Us and the slaves, a couple of the slaves, and probably what, eight or nine of us all went up to the sponsor ranch. You know, walking up and down through there, and all them people were sitting out there, and all those girls, and all the club brothers were trying to pick up on the girls, and uh, you know. Pulling their dresses up, some dead underpants. <laughs> no, those bulls. They're wearing dresses this time. When you oh yeah, right. Well, this is at the ranch site itself, right off, right, off, right off the road. What date is this? This was uh, fifteenth, <clears throat> night of the fifteenth. This is uh, I believe the night of the fifteenth was on a Friday. I'm not sure. Let's go back to the eleventh or twelfth. When you went up there that time to get Danny back, how many guys went with you? Uh, one guy went with me. A fellow, uh, John Hyde. He's one of the club brothers, too. John Hyde? Right. H-I or H-Y? H-Y-D-E. Uh, he split with one of the girls down in the woods, and I didn't see him, so I almost got ready to leave. Then he split at night, and I stayed. And, uh, Did Hyde overhear any of this conversation? Uh, no, he didn't. He was down there getting some snacks in the bushes. He got an old lady, and she found out that he even went in the bushes with a broad. Uh, he'd be in the sling, but... Somehow or other, I missed that eighth and ninth at Chile, right? For Charlie said he killed five people. Can you tell me exactly how he, he laid it out to you? Uh, he claims he walked in and he uh, just cut him up. So, you know, he just says he goes in and knocks on the door, they open the door, and he just goes in with his cutlass and uh, starts really putting the chop to him. Now, when we went up there, he ran around and the guys were harassing all the girls and everything. There was a cutlass standing there in the corner. Oh, and, a uh, real cutlass, like oh, a sword. A real cutlass, really, with aluminum hand that comes around like a here heavy aluminum, and aluminum right out to here, and uh, about this long. How long did we talk about the blade being? Mm, let's see, the handle's about a sole with a loop, and the blade <coughs> would be about, maybe about, th about this long. You ever seen a World War II machete? Yeah. The length of a machete? Anything similar looking to a machete? Yeah, it was just about like a machete, but it looks to me like I had a custom-made handle on. And to get to this, two years ago, approximately two years ago, when I first started knowing the straight sayings, I seen that knife stuck in the wall in our ex-president's house. Well, the knife came up missing, then I saw it up there. Charlie had it. He picks his cutlass up and he stands back maybe 50 feet. He throws it probably 10 times at a bale of hay and sticks it every time, or maybe misses twice out of 10. Sticks it right in there, thunk, right about in the center part of the bale of hay. So he's real good with it. He said it for quite a while. And the knife was up there, it came up missing. I think one of my club brothers copped it and took it home with him. And I'm worried, I just found out about this, uh, you know, just, it was gone, and somebody mentioned one of the brothers took it. So I'm trying to find it right now. I want to get that song, bitch. And, uh, uh, Charlie says, well, this one guy, he cut his ear off with it. I don't know if he, I think he killed a guy, too, but I'm not sure. 
you get a corpse with the ear cut off? Yeah, there's your man. I can prove it right down to the bare tee, and if I have to get Danny right down there, I'll... Danny's scared because he's a kid. They're trying to kill him already. They came down, and he sleeps in the milk truck, put it on their bread truck with him, him and his uh, kid. He's not too healthy of a guy anyway. He doesn't get too much up here when it comes to living civilized. But anyway, he's not a murderer, I know that. He's, Danny just ain't that way. Do you think Danny could be talked into going that way? No. No chance. Mm -hmm. He, <laughs> Danny, you get to talk to him and you just get to know the guy and you get no different. But Charlie convinced me right then and there he was a fucking homicidal maniac. He was just a fucking idiot or a blowhard. This first time you went up to see Charlie, were there any of his people around him, such as Tex or, oh, yeah. or Shorty? It was Clem. Tex was out back working on his doom buggy. I believe it is now that deceased Shorty was there. <coughs> uh, that little bastard. A little kid. I, yeah. Okay, so the first time that you go up to talk to Charlie, about what time do you get up there? I'd say I got up there about. It was just starting to get dark because I blew a headlight out. I had my Sportster on a Magneto and I blew a headlight out. I had to get a headlight lens out of a uh, small beam out of a car to put in to replace it because it was out high and we'll be both a shot. I just got out there and I was playing hell seeing myself go front of the little curve. So it was getting dark about that time, whatever that date was. About 8 o'clock and all? About 8 o'clock maybe. Okay, what time do you get out of there? I got out of there that night, the first night I got out of there about 11 or 12 o'clock. I went home and lost my hat. I just had a hat for about a year and the strap broke on it lost it on the freeway. So the next night I went back up there again and uh, I got up there almost the same time. And I stayed all night and the next morning about, or the next afternoon morning, it was about 1, 2 o'clock. Wait a minute, now you went up there on the 11th or 12th the first time? Right. And the next time you're back there on the 13th, then the 12th or the 13th. Yeah. Well, the next day, I went back the next day in the afternoon. You went back in the daytime. I believe it was in the daytime. I can't remember. But I went back, and I remember I was going real slow on the freeway. And I was looking for my hat. I couldn't. I couldn't find it. And I spent the night. About the next middle of the next day, I left. I went back home again, and there was my hat laying in the center divider of the freeway. So I pulled up into the center. I grabbed my hat, and I still got it at home. It was all beat down. And, uh, I wasn't. You know, this half of it wasn't on my mind, and I wasn't. I, I couldn't quite remember all the times and everything, but I can come pretty close. Okay, let's back up again. It's going to take a while, but I want to get it down as best we can. We talked, the first time you're up there is either the 11th or the 12th of August. Right. And you get up there around 8 p.m. and you stay till about midnight. And you're with up there with a guy named John Hyde. Your reason for going up there is to get Danny, Danny DiCarlo, who's a member of your club, come back. Uh, when you first start talking, Danny's trying to talk you into staying up there, and eventually he comes around to your way of thinking. Does he come back with you? Uh, he didn't come back with me until he got his, he said, well, I didn't let me get my shit together. He had to get his kid, and he had a, his truck up there, and he had his bike up there, and he had motorcycle parts going all over the fucking place, and he had to get all this shit together, and he just didn't want to just up and split right then. So I told him, I said, well, I says, uh, when Friday night comes, you better be at the meeting. Friday night comes, he wasn't at the meeting. So all of us went up for after him. Okay. So now, the 11th or the 12th, he does not come back with you? No. And on that date, in your conversation with Charlie, uh, Charlie tells you that he knocks on the door of rich people's homes, he goes in with his cutlass, which is his big knife, and he robs these people. He indicates he's only done this once, though, and that he says he just wiped out five people. Uh, he indicated at one time, he says, uh, he says, in the last couple of days, he's gotten five people. And uh, he's talking about how he's got a few places set up where uh, he can get all kinds of money or whatever, and he'll pay me this, and he'll pay me that, and uh, uh, he'll buy me a dune buggy, and he'll buy me a new motorcycle, and uh, <laughs> just all kinds of bullshit, like he's trying to bribe you or whatever to stay. So he bought Danny a doom buggy. This is how he got Danny to stay up there. Danny has never had too much in his life, and uh, 
the guy, the guy comes up with a legal dune buggy and says, here, take it. That's one of these things. He says, if you look at you and say, uh, you got a brand new motorcycle there, he'll say, can I have it? Is it mine? He'll say, uh, see that dune buggy, do you want it? Take it. Okay. So he is. You know, it's just, <laughs> he's a freak. Did he say anything else that night about killing people? Uh, well, he was talking about everybody getting together, getting all these dune buggies built, and the purpose of all the dune buggies was to pack everything on it and head to Death Valley and come into town and get in the car and have switches under the dash to turn the brake lights off, tail lights off, and the whole shot, and uh, just leave the headlights on and be tripping down the street and driving away and have a guy sitting here and a guy sitting here with the windows rolled down with a shotgun here and a shotgun here, and when the CHP pulls you over, one goes to this side, one goes to this side, but must have raspy looking guys in the car. As soon as they get right beside the car, blow them up. Now this was his thing, see? I said, see, you're nuts, man. <laughs> you're, you're out of your mind, you know. So why did he say he wanted to do that? Uh, he wants to off all of, he, he, he wants to build up a thing to where he can be leader of the world as this trip. He's, he's crazy. Does he have a name for his group? The family. The family is the Just the family is all he calls it. You want, to, you want to become, you want to join the family? He says, come on up here, you're in. You want to join the family? He says, have all the pussy you want and catch all the crabs and the clap and the sip and you can have it all, it's all free. <laughs> he didn't say that part, but that's what the most to. <laughs> and we'll give you a piece of information here before we go any further. We've talked to, oh God, 15 people in this group, including Charlie. And the one thing that comes out of it so far is that Charlie is trying to set up a little empire. Yeah, and, that's what he wants. Uh, he'd be the leader, and he's got all the girls, which is about all he's interested in. He wanted to be the boss all the way. Yeah, but what he wanted uh, the motorcycle people for, they were going to be his power, his strength. Right. And once he got them organized, if he'd give them the girls, then any time he got the fight... We'd back got, him up, he figured. They'd back him up, and they'd kind of do his bidding. They'd kind of be the strong arm fluffies for him. And the girls we've talked to, they told us more than once that a group of motorcycle guys came up and chased them all over the place and they had a few sex acts, this type of thing. And the girls felt that the sickle people were turned on about this and were quite happy. They liked to come up on weekends. And well, they wanted the pussy, man. That's all. Sure. <laughs> but uh, this, this was, Charlie was sitting back rubbing his hands together because this was working real well. I said the slaves were going up there, I guess. All I know is our club, out of, out of everybody there, went up there one time on that Friday, but on different occasions, dating back uh, maybe uh, mm -hmm. maybe a month before all this happened, a couple would go up, spend the night, and come back. A couple would go up, spend the night, and come back, and uh, get them a little or whatever. And then when all this bullshit started coming down, uh, everybody got sick of Danny being up there. Everybody got sick of catching their clap or the crabs or whatever. Nobody went up there. You know, uh, the ranch was just out of hand. So. Uh, so as far as that one. Okay, that's how we stand on the 11th. And then the next, the 11th or the 12th, do you remember if it was a Monday or a Tuesday that you went up there? Any way of judging the date? Danny didn't show up for the meeting Friday. Uh, you didn't go up there Saturday or Sunday, a weekend? I don't quite remember. It was, it was just one of them days when I didn't have anything to do and I was, uh, I got to thinking about the club and uh, I was falling apart and run down and Everybody's getting out of hand and thrown in jail all the time. And I says, well, it's about time I started doing something. Cause I've only been in the club a short while. I got in the club just like that. Everybody else took them six months to get in. and Nobody nobody had any common sense anyway. So after I got in the club, I wish I'd never done it. And, uh, <laughs> was, these guys, you know, these guys are falling apart. So I just got a wild hair in my head. That I heard a lot about this ranch. So I'll, I'll trip on up there. I had a wife and three kids, and I stick to home most of the time. And uh, I tripped up there and I just fell apart. I've never seen it like it before in my life. Never been to a nudist colony or I never met real idiots on the loose with a hair on like that. And just uh, you did go back the next day in the afternoon. Right. How long did you stay? It, could have, it was in the afternoon. I mean, in the afternoon from 12 to 6 or better on here. I stayed then. I stayed uh, half of the day because the sun was out. It was real hot yet. And it was just flies all over the place. And uh, I was so hot I didn't have to keep my shirt on. I rode all the way out there just just in my blue jeans. I took my shirt and everything off. I had my sleeping bag tied on the back of my bike and I was just cruising out there real slow, riding up through the mountains and the hills. And I finally uh, I went into the place and uh, there was Danny sitting there all drunk or not, son of a bitch and flies 
climbing all over me. He's got his colors hanging over his head so the flies can't get to his face. And uh, Charlie comes walking out of the woodwork someplace and starts rolling this shit down to me, trying to calm me into this bullshit. And uh, that's all I'm about. So I'll think about it. Well, the main thing is the club. We was gonna go up there. And I was gonna fix Charlie's ass. Uh, a lot of the guys in the club was gonna go up there. And be his ass and teach him a lesson not to uh, be a brainwashing one of our members and all this bullshit. The guys were all going to get together and go up there and get him all kinds of pussy and uh, do the thing, you know. Yeah. But nothing really out of hand. Might have got out of hand, but uh, it didn't happen that way. So, uh, but this afternoon that you that you go back, which is the next day, which will either be the 12th or the 13th of August, uh, you go up and you chat with Charlie some more. Does he make any other statements to you at that time? Uh, all kinds of offers of, again and again, of how he'd uh, give me the dune buggy and run down his trip and show me all these tools and his dune buggies and how he accumulated uh, this one and that one. And supposedly they were supposed to have all been bought, but some guy had been stealing them, taking parts up there and this and that. He was telling me how he could uh, uh, just give me one like that and there's nothing out of his pocket because uh, he gets the money from the from the rich people or whatever, whoever he robs or sends the girls out and buys stuff with stolen credit cards and sells it and and uh, just pulls all kinds of crazy shit. Were there any girls present during your conversation? With no, uh, he always uh, he always more or less uh, got out to the group of the guys. All the guys stuck together. See, when you talk to Charlie, then Tex is working on the dune buggy. Yeah, but he took me for a ride in the dune buggy, and I spotted what I thought was a a police car, undercover car, down the hill a ways. And these guys are so lame, they couldn't spot a police car a million miles away. And the guy had a camera with a telescopic lens on it. He was binoculars and picked up a pair of binoculars that were in a dune buggy. This dune buggy was equipped with every surplus the army could supply, you know, for survival. You know, binoculars and radio and canteens, water and everything. So I pick up the binoculars and I'm looking through them. And this guy's down there, he's getting things all and taking pictures. And I don't know if it was the you people or who it was. I told Texas, I says, why? I says, I don't know what you guys been doing or what you guys done or the half that shit you're telling me is the truth. I says, but uh, the guy down there is taking all kinds of pictures of the place. My bike was sitting down there. Hyde was sitting down there. And uh, I told him, I says, well, I says, uh, if you're dirty, you better get clean. And he took me down below the hill, stashed his dune buggy, and went back down to the ranch. And uh, Tex more or less disappeared then. I don't know where he went. Did Tex have any statement to make to you? No, Tex kept his mouth shut. Real tight. He was real he was real clean cut. His hair was a little long, <coughs> but he was a real it's like he was a college student. He was real healthy looking now. Okay. So there's you and Clem and Shorty in on that conversation. Yeah. Just the four of you. Mm-hmm. One other thing, when you go back the next day, did Hyde go with you? No, he didn't have myself. Uh, how do they see Hyde's bike in the daytime? This guy's taking pictures. Was his bike still up there? Uh, his, listen, I want, we was always sitting up there. Uh, let me see. My time's up, because it was definitely in the, I think he did go back up there the next day, but he went up there and he just, he just turned around and he split again. Took his wife with him. Trying to figure out. So, I mean, I can't, I can't quite get the time just right, but, uh, First night you went up there, then you come back the next day. When you come back the next day, uh, was Hyde with you? Hyde and his wife? No, he he told her, he says, uh, let's just go for a ride. We'll go for a ride and we'll go up there and I'll turn around and come back or whatever. No, because the second time I went by myself, I knew it because I rode on the freeway. So it might be a later time then that you go for a ride with this guy, Tex. Uh, it was almost getting dark. He had he, uh, we rode up way up in the hills while it was still light, and then when it started getting dark, we brought the dune buggy back down and uh, stashed it in some bushes. And then we walked down about a quarter mile down the street and uh, into, the, into the ranch. Trying to get it to uh, you probably you, You've talked to enough people in this case, I'm sure. You've probably figured out uh, uh, what time I was there, because I don't really know my mind. You know, these days, uh, I didn't see no reason why I should remember dates, you know. And, uh, no reason at all. <laughs> okay, that afternoon, uh, you get up there, we'll say around noon. What time do you leave? This is the second day. So you spent the night. Yeah, there. I spent the night, and the next day, sometime the next day, I left. Okay. Cause I, 
my bike wouldn't start. I pushed it and pushed it and got all hot and sweaty. It was starting. The sun was starting to come out and everything. And I spent the night in that very fucking canyon. And, uh, I had scratches and shit all over me, and I was just fed up with the whole fucking work. My skin bags were full of nits and ticks, and I just got the fuck out of there. So that afternoon, that night, and the next morning that you're there, do you have any more conversation with Charlie? Yeah, these, all these guys are all rapping and talking about all kinds of things to do with uh, killing people and getting their money the easy way. And what do they say specifically when we say they? Who are we talking about? We well, got Charlie. Charlie, Texan Clem are the three that uh, apparently seem to want to get me to stay up there. But Tex, he just, he'd come in, he'd say a few things. Yeah, that's right. He says, uh, you could, you, you know, you, you couldn't, uh, you don't want to pass up a good thing or something. Then he'd split off and he'd do his work. And but he never did. He ever, well, let me put it this way. Did he ever admit that he bumped somebody? No, he just ran a smile, you know, and he, 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 and all this. Like, he's crazy, too, but, uh, he doesn't want anybody to find out <laughs> on them kind of things. How about Clem? Clem from the word gold. He just uh, agreed with everything and said anything he could think of to say. None of, it had, none, none of it really made no sense, but to make me here, I come in on a brand new sports with my colors on, and uh, I'm supposed to be a big hero motorcycle rider, and he's standing down there with his butcher knife in his hand, and uh, wow, sure it was a pretty motorcycle. He's anything he can say to make me think that he's... Uh, uh, he can hold his mud, as they call it, you know. It's a, that kind of trip. Does he make any statement or admission that he's killed anyone? Or that he's been on his run? No, but he goes out at night and has a lot of fun. That's about it. He says he goes out at night and has a lot of fun. Right, he goes out with the guys. See, Charlie, Charlie, and I say Charlie and Tex are the ones that are supposed to have had the brains up there because uh, they're the cons. This fellow Shorty, he was stupid. He was really out of hand. So I think they put they, they snuffed him because uh, he got a little too stupid. And uh, the reason, well, Danny got wind that they snuffed him and cut him out in pieces. And uh, uh, this is all happening right about the same circle. And so, on top of all this and that, Danny wasn't sure he didn't know what was going on. And so well, now it's time to get the fuck out of there and just hang the place up. He comes back and tells me about it. Oh, uh, he told me he told me about he told me about him cutting them up after they got busted and got out of jail. So evidently, Charlie or whoever killed this fellow called Shorty killed him after the bust. When was the bust? The 16th, I believe. About the 16th. All right. You were up there, you see, on the 15th. That was the day before the bust? Right. Well, 15th and 16th, now this is the way I actually did it closest to the date because a lot, of, a lot of the guys are supposed to went to court or something and get cut loose or something about the damn thing. I think it was the 16th. And, uh, I had been up there, come back, went to the meeting the next day, and that night after the meeting, uh, everybody went up there and just uh, more or less put the shit to them, told them how it was. Have you had a counter? Let me break off here just for a second and get a calendar so we'll know what days we're talking about. Maybe we can pin this down a little I remember a lot. Just dates and times we get confused. The stuff he ran down to me is just more or less went one ear and off the other because I thought he was trying to throw an impression on me. That guy's a real flake. Good old Charlie. Yeah, good old Charlie. Didn't know how close he came to get his head caved in a couple times. By the game? Mm, yeah. I told him to his face what a skunk he was. This is uh, the average citizen the police officer. They Take a look at me when I got my colors on and then, you know, it's more trash going down the street or whatever. But out of the whole club, there's about 30 of us. Was myself and a few other ones. Myself, I like to, I like to stay clean in the club, you know, body-wise, dress-wise. I'll be all clean. I, I dress just like I am right now. I put my colors on. I get on my bike and I go down the street. You're going to give a motorcycle gang a new image in the world. Well, I get the most dirty, raggedy colors on, see. People see me this way all the time, except now when you want to run, that's a different story with Isabel and them other places. My Venice PD's got all our scrapbooks. You can see pictures of me in there. And all, I'm all dirty after about three days of steady riding and dirt, and that's a different story. Well, years from now, you'll be able to go back to Venice PD and get pictures to show your kids. Back get my, I'm going to go back and get my pictures back anyway, get my lawyer to get them back. Uh, how often do you have a meeting? Every Friday? Every Friday night. 
Okay, the Friday is the 1st, 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. Now, if you think the first time you're up there is the 11th and 12th, then it'd be a Monday or a Tuesday. And uh, possibly you went yeah. back on Wednesday afternoon the 13th and spent the night right. the next day the 14th, and then you'd have a meeting the 15th. Right, yeah, definitely. A meeting the 15th because uh, they were talking about we got to go to court and uh, get released. Well, what do you got to go to court for this time? Because everybody's going in and out of court. It's a big mass confusion in all these clubs. Everybody's got a court date every day. So, somebody kept saying the 16th. Well, what happened on the 16th? Oh, they cut us loose. And after that, uh... Now, who well, they cut loose on the 16th? Uh, supposedly, the way Danny tells me, everybody did. Because everybody was innocent. So, in Danny's mind, he figured everybody was innocent. And nothing had happened. So, the stupid bastard goes back up there again. All right, let me ask you this. On the 15th, you went up there, which would have been a Friday. Yeah. Uh, the whole club went up there on the 15th, the night of the 15th. That's where you had your meeting. No, we had our meeting. We had our meeting in Inglewood, and uh, we went up there right after the meeting, about probably 9, 10 o'clock, right around there, maybe at 11, 9, 10 or 11. And from there, we grabbed Danny down the plank on Ventura Boulevard, party with all the slaves down there. And then at the bar closed at 2 o'clock, and there wasn't no more beer to get drunk. We all hopped on our bikes and wobbled our way back up there again. Okay. And uh, we all stayed and ran around and uh, get these girls off to the side. And these guys are... That's Saturday the 16th. Well, actually, it'd be Saturday, yeah. Okay. Late, 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 late Friday night. And uh, the guys running around, and they seen these couple of hippie dudes up there that was... I don't know where they came from. They were sitting up there plunk on their guitar, and Charlie's got them up there. The guys go by, and they say, what's that? He says, that's my guitar, and he picks it up and hits the guy over the head with it, see. <laughs> so uh, I go up there and I say, man, this ain't, you know, this ain't too cool, you know, you're going you're gonna to get Charlie and these fucking freaks and their knives to throw in the fucking things from the dark bushes. These guys ain't using their head, you know, I say. And uh, besides that, Charlie tells me he's got a guy over there and a guy over there in the haystack and a guy over there behind the hill with guns loaded. And we're standing under a thing with a couple light bulbs glittering at it, and the people are standing off in the dark, and people walk back and forth. It's easy to pick anybody off, you know. These guys ain't using their head, they're all drunk. <laughs> so, uh, uh, got to be about probably four, I think, or five, right close to that time. And one of the slaves come up there, Slave uh, Richard. Uh, slave Richard came up there. He got he got one of the girls up in the back room, and he was making it with her, and I said, well, I'll see you later, fellas, and out to my bike, and I split. No, I didn't need to take that back. I didn't even ride my bike that night. I went to the bar or went up there. I rode it all week, but we took a car because I wanted to, you know, make sure I got Danny and brought him back and everything. It was a uh, 59 Oldsmobile. Went up there, uh, got in the car, and split. And Did you take Danny with you? No, huh? He stayed there. He spent the night. He was going to come back in the morning. And one of the other club brothers stayed up there with him. And I uh, was going to make sure he'd come back in the morning. The guy, he didn't drink too much or get too loaded on anything, so he was going to be assured that uh, Danny was back. And uh, just after I left, whew, here they come. And the way they talked, it was coming out of the woodwork. Huh, you know, the police was all over the place. So you got out just before the bus, and the yeah. bus was on the 16th. Yeah. How many of your people ended up in a bucket on that bus? To uh, uh, Reinhardt and uh, uh, Danny Carlo. They go to jail for it. Suspicion of something. I never did find out what they went to jail for. They just went to jail. <laughs> they never said anything. Okay. During that time that you're up there, uh, this would be the night of the 15th, your club meeting yeah. party, and the morning of the 16th. Do you have any conversation with Charlie or Clem or Tex or Shorty or anyone else? Well, I had a little salty one with Charlie. I told him, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, we're taking Danny home with us, and he says, yeah, yeah, he says, I thought you were seeing things my way. I said, well, you know, I says, I don't want you stabbing me in the fucking back when my back's turned, so I'm going to stand here now and insinuate that I, I'm getting along with you all right, you know, and he said, I you sneak a motherfucker, you're going to kill me, you know, if I'm not looking. And uh, he said, well, you had to bring all your brothers up here with you, didn't you? He said, well, you know, I says, if you was in my boots, what would you do? So, uh, He's bending over working on a dune buggy, mumbling, dirty son of a bitch, and you know, I don't like to be called a dirty son of a bitch, and he's getting hot at me because I'm taking Danny, and Danny's dune buggy, what he's giving him, 
and uh, Danny's truck and all of Danny's tools, Danny's motorcycle parts, and Danny's colors, you know, for the for the impression on all the other people. Uh, I uh, picked the pipe up and I told myself, you know, I said, I'll bash your fucking head in with it, but I got more sense than you guys. I'd be in jail just like that, even for killing a scum pig like you. And he turns, he looks at me, and he winds up in the bushes. And right after that, I got the fuck out of there because I knew something was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to be with the police. Did you see Shorty there that night? No, I didn't. That's one of the guys I didn't see. But after that bust, Shorty was supposed to have gotten knocked off. And that made Danny sick just to hear about it. Danny, Danny and Shorty more or less sit off and bullshit because Shorty was a real lame duck. Was that word? He was a real duck. He could say, Shorty, do this. Shorty, do that. And he'd do it. This could have been enough killings too, but uh, he got to know too much and hear too much and get worried too much. That's what they say. So they just cut, him, cut his arms and his legs and his head off. And yeah, okay, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, right. Death of Shorty in a minute. Well, the 15th and the 16th, then, is uh, kind of a no-conversation trip, right? Yeah. Now, up to this time, to this week, uh, let's start at the 11th. From the 11th to the 15th, assuming you went up on the 11th to get Danny back, uh, you didn't get him back, so Danny no. spent that week up there. Right. Okay. Now, the 16th, he gets thrown in jail. When he gets out of jail, does he come back to the group? Uh, he was back with the group for uh, about a day and a half. And then uh, he hadn't brought all, all of his stuff back yet. So he went back up there again. When he got back up there, this one little girl he was really hung up on, Sherry. I think he talked to her. He's yeah, mentor. He got hung up on her. I think she's underage anyway. And uh, he's trying to get her to come back. And she's scared out. Uh, Charlie's going to kill her. And Charlie's getting hot at Danny in. Because Danny's uh, moving out slowly but surely. You can see it coming. So uh, Charlie's supposedly now. That's what Danny tells me. Sends uh, this Bruce and some other guy down to Venice, knows where Danny lives, knows where Danny hangs out, caught him sleeping in his bread truck one night, and uh, it appeared to him if he wouldn't have got to his 45 in time, they was going to off him. They walked, they opened, they pried the door open, and they went right in there, you know, and uh, Danny was right there uh, on his guard the way, he, the way he runs it down to me, and he's never lied to me before, so as crazy as these guys are, it's hard to tell. But, uh, now, who did Danny say came into his truck or his home? A fellow named Bruce and another guy. And he is, the other guy is, right? Do you remember what day that was? Uh, no, I don't know what day, what day this here was. It just happened. It was after the bus, though. Mm -hmm. Charlie's starting to get worried, I guess. No protection. When do you go back up there again? This would be your about your fourth time going up there now. I'm going to go up three times, I guess, all together. Up there. there. Yeah, time. about four times, yeah. About four times all together I went up there. At night, then up there the <coughs> next day, spent the night, and then up there the night of the 15th and the morning of the 16th. Do you go back after that? I didn't go back the morning of the 16th. Uh, Oh, you stayed, actually. Yeah, well, actually, I stayed until the 16th, you know. Yeah. And I split, and that was it. I never did go back. You never went back. I heard they all got busted and haven't been back to this day. Okay. For a fact, then, what Charlie has said to you, has there been any other admission other than that you go to a rich person's house, knock on the door, and wave this cutlass or this long machete knife at these people and rob them? <laughs> and that he would, after he'd stick them, he'd take their blood and write on the wall or something. No, he uh, more or less wraps it all up and uh, when he says he's going to do something, he uh, he's going to do it. He does. He, he says he uh, he doesn't have to say something and uh, try to impress somebody. <coughs> and he's one of these kind of guys. I imagine a lot of he probably <coughs> he'll, well, he wouldn't probably want to talk to you the way he talked to us, but he get out there on the floor and he'll talk to you and show and throw all of his emotions and everything right into it, just he's up there jumping around and he says, well, we've got him like that and we've got him like this and he just really, you can just see in his eyes, he's just, he's an idiot. <laughs> uh, well, he's talking, who's this text, Clem, Shorty, are they sitting around watching? Well, this little room we was in, it was a left room far to the far left end of the ranch and the front door was closed, 
the back door was open, and the dune buggies were right there, and the guy set a horse trough up and put a fan on it, and that was going to bed out of hell, and it slid down about threw the fan off, and everybody started to run, but we got that put out, and Tex was right by the door working on his dune buggy in the light, and we was all sitting in that little room right there. Well, Tex heard the conversation. Yeah, and they had their, uh, uh, I mean, he heard part of it, yeah. I wouldn't say all of it, but he heard part of it. Clem was there, and Shorty was there. Uh, yeah, and there was another guy there, too, but I don't know who the hell it was. You ever hear of a guy named Boussoulet, Bobby Boussoulet? Mm -hmm. Name Bobby sounds familiar, but I don't know about Boussoulet. You mean, how about a girl named... Uh, Bosley is the way it was run down to me, uh, Robert, or Bobby Bosley. Bosley? Well, this Bosley. is a funny name that can get pronounced a lot of ways. Yeah. What have you heard about Bobby Bosley? I heard he uh, killed a fellow named, uh, let's see, Inman, I believe it was. Where did you hear that from? I heard this here from Danny and uh, the fellow called Clem. What did Danny say specifically about the murder of this guy, Inman? Uh, he told me that he uh, heard from hearsay about it. But what he apparently seems to know, but he won't tell me too much. He's, he's getting a little worried and getting a little scared about this or that. But it, uh, on his own, I got to go down and talk to the Venice police. So anyway, I can get him to come down here and talk to you about that. I'd rather have him talk to you about that because I, I can't get too far. But what he said was that uh, almost beyond a reasonable doubt he can prove uh, or whatever that uh, this Boosley or Bosley or whatever he was killed this guy. and. I don't think Charlie was in on it or something. Anyway, somebody cut his ear. Did they cut his ear off? This one got his ear cut off. Yeah, right. He says, well, he says, I took that big old uh, machete and he goes, cuts the guy's ear off. I don't know cut off while he was alive or dead or whatever. So people tell me these things and these this people in this clinic good. up there. And then this is what you heard from DiCarlo about yeah, this right. murder. What did you hear from Clem about this murder? Um, about the same thing close to it. He said he started laughing and he's a real jerk anyway. He'd go along with, he's, he's almost like Shorty. Anything you tell him to do, he'd do. Was Clem present when <coughs> DiCarlo was telling no, you uh -huh. about the murder? No, Danny told me about this the other day, see. Okay, when did Clem tell you about the murder? <coughs> uh, Clem came down into town with a kid called Mark. And I asked him when they, what the excitement was going on. There was another fellow named Mark. Now, I don't know uh, Mark's last name. And you might have gotten a hold of him by now or whatever. But when did that conversation take place? It seemed to me that, uh, I can't quite remember when it took place. See, now he didn't, Danny told me, Henlon, but uh, this goofy bastard, all he said was uh, laughing about how they had done somebody in and they cut, cut his ear off. And Who's the goofy bastard we're talking about right uh, now? Clem. Clem. One called Clem. So in your Congress, you heard about Hinman's death through Danny. Clem. No, I heard it through Danny. But well, you said what? Danny told you about that the other day. Yeah, he told me about it the other day. When did you talk to Clem? I talked to Clem on. Uh, <clears throat> it was. About, it was after the bust or something. He he finally gotten around to saying something about he cut somebody's ear off and uh, blended on the Panthers. So writing on the wall, blamed it on the Panthers, and that was about all it was to it. The first you heard of the murder of Hinman then was from Clem. Well, I'm, I'm relating this to what Danny told me. See, Danny told me the other day that uh, uh, he, he was scared because they, they threatened to kill him, and he didn't know what to say or do, and he didn't know whether it was much of bullshit or what. But uh, uh, a fellow named Hinman was killed, and this Bosley was supposed to have done it, along with one or two of the other guys up there, which he didn't get down to. And then I related this with what I heard before from Clem, stating how they had cut some fucking idiot's ear off and wrote it on the wall and put the panther hand or the paw up there to blame it on the panthers. And everything they did, they blamed it on the niggers, say. They, they hate niggers because they had killed a nigger prior to that. Okay. This is what Clem has told you then. Yeah. Originally. And Charlie also told you that they took somebody's Somebody took their hand. Charlie told me everything that they did, they tried to uh, pin it on the Black Panthers. And I presume uh, he got that, that that idea after he, after uh, 
get killed that colored guy. Okay. Uh, when he, the first time you had a conversation with him, and he says he chopped people up with his cutlass, and he wrote on the wall uh, with their blood, and he also made mention that time of taking the, the handprint and putting that on the wall in blood too. Is that correct? Either handprint or a, drew a black panther print, yeah, right. Okay. Now, did anybody ever have the refrigerator wrote on? Why does that come up? Because he told me something about writing something on the refrigerator. Who said he wrote on Charlie. The Charlie said that they wrote something on the, on the fucking refrigerator. Why in did blood. did he tell you that? And this is all about the same time. He was writing on the wall, and he said something about a refrigerator. Did he say what he wrote? Something about kegs or niggers or something like that. I well, see, he, he, he's a fast talker, and he just blaps all this bullshit down. It's, uh, the more I think, the, you know, the more I think of bullshit that, he, that he's uh, come off the wall and said. It's really confusing. Let's go back to the refrigerator. Just take whatever length of time is necessary to remember as much as you can of that conversation. Uh, it was all added in the same one, really. It was uh, about the 12th or 13th when I was up there. He was talking about yeah, we really fixed them. He says, we got them good. He says, we uh, chopped them all up, went in there and done the thing on it, wrote on the wall and wrote something on the refrigerator. Something was stated about something being wrote on the refrigerator. This is all I know about that. And Charlie said he did Charlie that. Charlie said he did that, yeah. Who was present with all of these Oh, yeah, same guys. Were, sure. Yeah, the same guys. Were, they all stood right there. While they're standing there and they're talking to me, they're uh, throwing their knife into a corner post of the... Uh, view up through the doorway and everything, and uh, he's only going to walk maybe five feet to pick it up. He pulls it out and takes it out of his sheath of his leg and like that, and everything all in one action, trying to show, impress me how good he is with that knife. Cause every time he throws it, and I'm sitting there, sticks every stinking time, you know. So, uh, this knife, this machete thing, you, you say he carries that in his leg in a leg sheath? No, he carries a little hunting knife in a leg sheath down there. Oh, and that's the pan. one he reaches down and throws. Right, and the other one he carried in his uh, thing like a he was just stuck it in his, in his pants and a belt or whatever. Well, I think I can get that one for you if you haven't got it already, because they come up missing. I don't know if you got it or not, but maybe I can, maybe I can dig that knife out. Anything you can dig up, we appreciate. Well, it'll save me looking for it. If you got it, uh, it'll save me looking for it. But otherwise, I can tell these guys I got the habit. This is all there is to it. I don't know if you have it or not, but... we got a collection of knives, and I don't know which knife goes well, there. That particular it's got color. a blade this wide, about that long, like that. And it's got a... Nice aluminum handle on it. When you talk about, yeah, let's do a little drawing here. Show me the, show me the way that thing works. Work. Thank you, fucking hell. Okay, we won't grade you on, on art today. Actually, the blade is a little longer than well, that. Here. Yeah, just draw it. Okay, just get it, not to scale, but on that one sheet of paper. and George had it for a while. So we're talking and, uh, <coughs> about I don't know if I had anything back yet. I might have had a little lip neck or something right here. And a little deal here, a real small one did, I'm not really sure. But if it's still in circulation you haven't got it, I can find it with it. I suppose it's not missing that night. Like the handle of this thing it looks little, like the letter D. Right, it looks like the letter D and it's uh, unpolished, just plain aluminum. It is aluminum. Looked, well, I got it in my hand before. I picked it up and George had it stuck in his wall when, I, when he lived at the uh, 14 Westminster in Venice. Do you have any trouble getting your hand on that grip? Is it no. real big? Uh, it's a pretty good size loop. Okay. Yeah, the length of, in the knife itself is steel, I assume. Yeah, uh, steel. Uh, the loop would be about right here, I'd say. The knife would be about that long. So we talk at 18 inches? That or maybe just a little better. Maybe 18 is about well, good to feet. And about how wide do you think it would be? When I first flashed on it, I thought it was a bayonet, an extra long bayonet with a, with a handle made on it, but the blade was about so wide. It would be as wide as this book of matches? Oh, yeah. That wider. About that wide. About as wide as the yeah, book right. of matches. And it tapers down to a point. Right. And he had, uh, he had that thing razor sharp. He was always talking about how he could shave himself with his cutlass. I'm like some kind of fucking idiot. But. How thick would this blade be? Uh, Take a book of matches again. Yeah, almost like this. 
It'll be about be almost a width of there. a book of matches and taper down to a Just fine, a, sharp point. The top over here and a sharp edge would be here. it would be about this wide. It's a, it's a get-go. Maybe a little, maybe not quite that wide. Maybe about this much. I, have, I think I had a little dip. I had a little dip down like that. Would it look anything like the knife on that book of matches? Yeah, but uh, a little it, bit dressier yeah. looking. Yeah. Well, it was a, definitely a cutlass. It was a cutlass. Yeah. Okay, we can get that word down pat now. In fact, if I go to some of the club members' <coughs> photo albums, I can find you a picture of that knife in one of our albums someplace. And Venice Detectives has that. Well, no, I've got all my pictures. They didn't accumulate that, but uh, mine are all 68, 69 pictures. All right, if you can come up with a picture of that thing. Well, I might be able to do better than that. I might be able to come up with a knife. Come up with a knife. That was better, yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to have come up missing. So all the brothers got together and they says, Danny is, uh, this Charlie's got a hell of an arsenal up here, I hear. Danny's cause Charlie's saying how he's got guns here, guns there, guns there. that had a rack of guns in this little room was having a chat. And the first day I was there, one of them dates I was there, the whole rack was full of guns. I went up there again, I looked at it, I wanted to see how many guns were there, and if there was any of them fucking idiots on the bushes with a gun, you know, behind my bag, because I was starting to get salty with Charlie. Two twenty-two rifles were gone. So uh, wow, you know, uh, better take it easy on that, because they, they come up missing. Just to the best of your recollection, let's start with shotguns. Did you see any shotguns? Yeah, but I don't know the gauge. Danny could tell me right up front the gauge, because Danny, on firearms, is an expert. He's uh, in the service. He's got a some stars or ribbons or something for it. You know, he's an expert. He can tell you how any of them works and what they are, the caliber and the size, just by looking at them. Okay. How many shotguns did you see? I believe, I'm not going to be sure, but I believe there was two shotguns. Any of them sawed off? It might have been sawed off that much because it looked a little shorter, but I didn't even talk about really sawed off. But, uh, I think it was just, they wanted to keep it legal or whatever, but it was sitting in the rack. How about a double barrel shotgun? No, I didn't see a double gun shotgun. You see an over and under? No. He's supposed to have six or seven guns stashed in the bushes someplace. So when they could all run to their hiding places and the police come in here, uh, they could all run to their hiding places and uh, pick, them off, pick off a few of them before they got in the gun buggies and got in the rounds. So. How about rifles? Yeah, they had a couple high power rifles up there. Anything with a scope? Excuse me. No. All right. No. Saw nothing with a scope. No. Uh, what would make you think they were high powered rifles? As because we took them all out there and we shot the fuck out of them. Oh, yeah? Right in the front. <laughs> How about 22s? Uh, the time we shot the 22s, this, this happened the first day. When we shot the 22s, there was a totem pole in the parking lot of Spawn's Movie Ranch. And they had somebody to nail some horns up there. And these guys are all sitting out there and everybody's got a gun in their hand and they're just blowing away at everything. And his cars are going by the street, and I'm telling these guys, you know, what the fucking crazy idiot, the place is going to be here just like that. And uh, he shot up probably uh, maybe a hundred rounds out of all the guns all together. Can, before we go into the guns, can I go back to the knife for a minute? Sure. Yeah. This thing. Is it sharp on both sides, or is it no. blunt? Or it's sharp on this side, and it wasn't sharp up here. But after Charlie got it, he had a razor sharp, because it never was that way before. He claimed it was razor sharp and he could cut it in and he's going like that. I didn't get on feel of the fucking thing, but well, still, he was always, he's, he sent it off to some uh, sharpening place to have, to have his knife sharpened. I can find this out, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, the name of the sharpening place. Right, yeah, his knife sharpened somewhere. Let me ask you one thing. You say it wasn't sharp on top, but when he gets down here by the blade, could he have sharpened it on both sides? Uh, he could have. Doesn't. He's a knife freak, so I mean, you know, stands for reason if you're going to stab somebody, uh, you don't want it to worry it was going to get the job done. But you didn't see it. No, uh, mm -hmm. when George had it, I don't believe it was. It wasn't. It wasn't that way. Mm -hmm. I picked it up and played with it before, you know, in the house. Picked it up and tripped on it. And, uh, Did he, Charlie, tell you himself that he sent his knives out to be sharpened? No, Danny told me that. Okay. On the guns, how many lever action rifles? Or, yeah. huh. They had one thirty out six, I think. Now, no, I'm not really sure if it was a thirty out six or what it was. I mean, a 30-30. I had a deer rifle one time. I had a 30-30. This would be like the 30-30 lever action model. Yeah, you know, one of those. Right. Yeah. I believe they had one of those up there. What did you fire when you were up there? Uh, I fired a 22 uh, single action. You pull the bolt back, stick a bullet in it, and 
shut it like that, and I shot the deer horns down off that post up there. You got a long barrel job? Very big long shot. Like How about in handguns? Anything? 45 big? caliber. Would this be an automatic or a pistol? Uh, automatic. And that belonged to DiCarlo, I believe, but I'm not sure. Okay. And I heard talk of and was told by Danny that they had a 22 butt line long barrel, you know, pistol, nine round. I don't know what actually what the name brand it was, but you know, it's a butt line style. Danny was in those guns and all that was a butt line, nine round with a long barrel and uh like the wider or whatever he had the big long barrel jobs. Mm -hmm. And this is what's supposed to have uh killed that uh Black Panther. He Charlie was Black Panther. Yeah, well this this other guy was supposed to have killed him or something and Danny says uh Charlie claims he uh pulled his gun out and uh this is about a week before I even went up there. Oh. Let me interrupt you here because if we get talking about Black Panthers, I'm going to lose the gun inventory in my mind. Uh, you saw 45. You heard talk of a 22 bloodline. What, what brought that conversation up? Uh, about the bloodline? Yeah. Uh, Charlie comes along and uh, he says uh, something about, well, you got me on. See, I, I was trying to separate Shorty and uh, all these other cases apart. And I want to say, I want to say one at a time. Okay, now to get to the color guy. How about the gun now. Uh, Charlie's standing there and he's saying, uh, "So you asked me a while ago, did I know anything about any other killings he talked about? Well, this here is another incident that he told me before, and I really thought it was a bunch of bullshit. Now all this stuff comes up, and I find out that uh, it's got to be real. Now they're supposed to buy a whole bunch of kilos of grass. Okay." Black Panther's involved. And he's uh, he's got all the all the stuff. So Charlie's supposed to pay a couple thousand dollars for a heavy quantity. Well, they all go down there, and Charlie gets all the weed. And, uh, he's supposed to take the money down and pay this guy. Well, the guy's sitting at his desk, and he's sitting there, or, or the desk like the way he impressed me. If I doing it in a house behind any old desk, but he sit there and. Uh, there's a white guy over here and a white guy over here. Charlie's standing there with a couple of the other guys. I don't know exactly which ones. And uh, the guy's saying, well, look, uh, where's my money, Charlie? And Charlie's saying, well, you know, uh, something much ain't getting it or some fucking thing. And the guy says, uh, <laughs> says, I'll have you killed and I'll have my, all my Black Panther brothers up there and wipe your place out. So Charlie uh, pulls out a gun or somebody else is going to do it. And Charlie pulls out a gun and he points it at the guy. And he goes click, 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 click. And the gun didn't go off four or five times. The guy stood up and says, Hi. He says, You come here with an empty gun on me. And Charlie says, Click, bam. Right in the heart area somewhere. He told me this personally right at his face. And Danny ran it down to me too. And that was what the butt line was used, used on. Long barrel job. Who were the guys that were with Charlie on that shooting took place? I don't know. There was the two guys that were friends of their color guy. Because yeah. once they saw right out front the kind of guy Charlie was and the guys that was uh, being backed up by Charlie, uh, they, <laughs> they was off the lunch on that. So they picked up the carcass and took it off supposedly to some park. I heard Griffith Park was one of them. Could have been. Some park uh, you know, around near Griffith. They took the body off and dumped it there and they just got in the wind and kept their mouth shut. Cause Charlie and all the guys that were supposed to have uh, known about it one of them didn't get them, the other one would, see. So they got scared. And uh, Charlie's bragging all this bullshit down for me. This is all hearsay, but it's hearsay right from Charlie. Did Charlie ever say who was with him when this happened? Or was there anybody you see in the room? He, didn't, he mentioned a few names, but it doesn't, I don't recall it in my, in my mind. But I can uh, find out definitely for a fact exactly who was with him. All right. Occasion. Let me ask you this. During this conversation, uh, there's other people present in the room. I assume yeah. that you're looking at them from time to time. Without letting your mind wander too far, did anybody have a look on their face like they might have been involved in this thing? Are they? Oh, they're fucking idiots. All of them. As far as I'm concerned, a whole side of maniacs, and they stood out there and he 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 yeah. Well, we got them here. <laughs> that kind of shit. So. None of them, them looked shocked or uh, worried about the motherfucking thing. They didn't. They couldn't care to 
ceiling fell in. Okay, this, I got a fan flew off the motor. They had a plain motor and a fan flew off, and it went that way across the room. Everybody just said, I got up and got out the door, man. <laughs> These guys don't care about nothing. Danny, he covered up and got underneath a blanket and pulled a barrel over in front of him when he heard all the noise and the thing started sliding down. What other guns did you see there <clears throat> in the way of handguns? Uh, handguns, uh, all I saw really was that 45. I uh, heard tell about the other one, Danny told about. I'll tell you what, I can, uh, you go ahead and talk to me what you want to about today. Okay. And I'll get Danny and I'll run it down to him just how it is for his own uh, welfare in the future because I know this is going to get heavy. And uh, if any shit looks like it's going to fall on him, I better get his ass down here and get it straightened out first. Because sure uh, would be, cause this gets to be quite a capital My father used to be a police officer, and, you know, so a lot of it rubbed off on me. And when I was in Bay City, Michigan. How long have you been out here? I've been out here for approximately two and a half, four years. From Grand Rapids. Who's this guy, Reinhardt? Reinhardt? Uh, Robert Reinhardt. He uh, was... Uh, I've been stuck now for about a year, year and a half. I never get too close to the guy because he, I, don't, I don't like I don't like the guy too well. Why? No, just to me he's a prick. So he really he's a freak. Uh, well, not a freak. He just, uh, he's a hustler and a dealer and he winds up fucking everybody. And uh, On one occasion he took a really good friend of mine's motorcycle. And I told my friend, I says, you know, I says, uh, no, you can go to the police because if you do, uh, uh, they're going to bring shit down on my club. and Besides that, uh, they'll never find your bike. So let me take care of it. So I went right to him because I knew who the fuck did it. Because uh, he sold him a front end. He wanted his front end back. I told him, I said, Robert, I said, uh, you went against my word as a brother. I told you not to ever steal this bike. And uh, he promised me he wouldn't. He took the fucking bike. And I got the bike back in peace. And I rode it back to the guy's house for him. And ever since then, I've never had respect for him. And uh, every time he looks at me, uh, I see that shady look as if he had... Uh, Try to beat me out of something, but he's not a killer, we'll see. He just don't yeah, peg him as a killer. No, no. You ever see him rough anybody up? No, no, never. Does he carry a knife? He doesn't carry anything. He's real clean. It, no, he's in the in the straight yeah. in the straight slave. In the straight slave. Straight 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 see, I'll tell you, I'll be right off front with you. I'm not going to cover for anybody in my club or whatever because, uh, uh, you know, I've been in the club now for almost a year, and this brotherhood thing is not what it's supposed to be in the first place. And uh, they're not holding dirty, but they're all a bunch of, to my opinion, to be outlaw riders, they're all a bunch of phonies from the word go. Okay, I don't know, we're tough, there's a word tough, that didn't watch two cops. Where's the door? See, they ain't gonna sit there and fat mouth them, you know. Uh, I sit there, I don't, I, I, I never fat mouth any police officer when I get a ticket or nothing. Uh, yes, sir, no, sir, uh, uh, what's the problem? Fat mouth's gonna put you in the problem. Oh, of course it is. Uh, that's where you get your bad impression. I get, I get pulled over on the freeway and, uh, cop comes up to me and starts talking to me and I said, boy, this is uh, awful pleasant to be wearing a set of these dirty old punky colors on this pretty brand new motorcycle and all dressed clean. I said, well, you know, I found him on the street and <laughs> the guy laughs at me. What can I say? Well, anyway, hey, this guy is one of, the, one of your club, one yeah, of the club right. members. What about Zorba? You ever hear a guy named Zorba? Zorba. Zorba the Greek. Yeah, I've seen that movie. <laughs> uh, he hangs out the plane. Zorba, he's not a straight saint. No, Satan slave slave. Oh, is he a Satan slave? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I can get to him if he's a slave then. Uh, no, I don't know him. See, I don't know about probably, out of all the slaves, which they try to tell our club that they've got 50 members, and I know they only got 10 or 15 going, see. And we tell their club that we got 40 or 50, you know. So we're all 1%, we're like, you know, who I do is who, you know. We don't want to see our books and see how many we got. We only got probably 30 all together, and there's probably about 10 of us running around. So, uh, I want to met maybe half of them slaves. This is our, I've heard the name though. Have you ever seen the guy up there at the spawn ring? Which one? Uh, Zorba. No, uh -huh. I've never seen him. I've just heard his name, but I can find out and I'll straight you on him anyway. Listen, can we take a break and get a cup of coffee? You want uh, coffee? Good. Right? I'm just going to hit. Yeah. What, what kind of? Uh, just black with it. Uh, Why don't you get the coffee and drain your kidney? Oh, I've got to. I couldn't believe all this murder and bullshit. Well, other than what we've talked about so far, let's stick with fact right now. 
Well, that's what I'm trying to because. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that's fact that you haven't heard right from Charlie's mouth? Anything that I have or haven't heard? Haven't heard? That we haven't. Anything that you've heard from Charlie that we haven't talked about here today so far? Well, that pretty well covers it unless I think of something. Uh, in these two days, he put a con on me like you've never seen a con put in your life. I've talked to Charlie. He's a con man. Sure is. That's where he, how he got to be where he is today. In jail. Well, <laughs> <laughs> jail. Yeah, right. Well, what else have you heard now? Let's go into what you've heard. I think when we get talking about what you've heard, then we'll hear about some of these murders. Uh, how many murders for an opener have you heard about? I've heard him tell me about approximately four. I mean, four, you know, one would have supposed to be four or five killed. And uh, the, the uh, fellow showed that was supposed to be in the family. And uh, this other guy. So I say, uh, by the other guy, we're talking about the Panther? Yeah, right, yeah. Hinman. So I get these guys off to the side, and uh, a, lot, a lot of the guys around that know these people, I start asking questions. When I start asking questions, I sneak off to the side a little farther, and I just jot little things down. And uh, Like I put down this uh, Gary Hinman, and pig with wood on the wall, and a big paw representing the Black Panthers. And the fellow uh, that was told to me by Danny that killed him was uh, Bobby Bosley, alias Jasper Daniels, nicknamed Cupid. And uh, when I got all this, before that, I heard uh, this, uh, what do I call it, the idiot there, what I go on? Clem? Clem. Tell me about one that jived right through this. So that's why I relate that with this. See. Now, what did Clem have to say again? Uh, he just mumbled and blabbered around about how they had uh, really fixed somebody up and, and chopped his ear off or or uh, whatever, or snuff the dude, and they blamed it down, blamed it down the niggers, blamed it on the Black Panthers. That's about all his conversation about it, too. If you've you got him, you probably talk to him, he's kind of, he's kind of a, he's a real quack. I don't, know, I don't know how he is when he's down. He's usually uh, pretty well off the lunch by the time I get up there and get drunk or loaded on something or whatever. Yeah, or Clem was escaping in Camarillo, if that means anything. Who told you that? Uh, Danny told me that because uh, Danny talked to all of them, you know, serious, and they all confided in me. Now, Tex, Tex was an escapee from, uh, or not escapee, just a fugitive, but this fellow Shorty, I don't know if you got his full name or not, but he was an escapee from someplace too. What name do you have for Shorty? Shorty. Just Shorty, period. Yeah, but uh, I can come up with something better than that. You drink your coffee. Thanks a lot. One more trip, I've got a green one. Kitty there. Uh, do you know when this death of Hinman goes down? Uh, not really, but it's not been too long ago. It's, it seems to me, uh, I recollect that. Uh, I got all this information after they was out of the deal uh, after the bus the 16th. This was just told to me about how they had done somebody in sometime before that or whatever. It could have been, uh, let's see, but get the dates right. It's just that clown come up and he's blapping his bullshit about uh, blaming it on the niggers and writing uh, blood on the wall and writing a uh, tiger paw blaming it on the niggers, the panther paw. Uh, then Danny comes up and he says to me, he says, I'm scared now. I says, what I'm going to do? He says, uh, he didn't have nothing to do with it. And uh, I said, well, you want to talk to the police about it? He says, uh, sure do. But uh, I told him, I said, well, you're not going to be implicated. Uh, they wanted to turn the tape recorder on. He had to turn it off. And he ran down to them exactly what uh, what would happen if if them guys caught up to him again or whatever. And they would butcher him. Uh, well, you can see what they do to him. So he's... That's a big uh, jail. In his mind, he might have more sense than I do because he's scared. Um, me, I'm not scared, but I'm not, I don't try to be out of hand, big, tough, or anything like that. I never have been. Yeah, but uh, well, I'm not. I just, in my mind, I'm not scared of the motherfucker. Let him come on. If he wants to come on. It's gonna be his. It's gonna be his death because I'm ready for him. 
Let me give you something to think about here, and you can take it back and give it to Dan. Uh, you take the club that you belong to, or any signal club. You know, everybody's together, and there's 40 guys together, and there's two other people you can be just stronger than hell. Manson's found a little group out there. The group's all together, and they're, they're pretty strong, and they're pretty tough. You take Manson by himself, or any guy in that group by himself, and Nothing. Plus he sneaks on you. That's it. But I don't think he's that well organized. No, he's not because I think you people pretty well got him pulled apart. So I, I really, uh, if there were anything to worry about the guy, uh, we'd be worried about it that somebody else is going to get knocked off. But in this situation, as it stands, he's so pulled apart. Uh, that organization he had at Squan Ranch pulled it. The one in Death Valley is beat down to nothing. Uh, I read me some paper about that bust that Death Valley did on. Uh, did you people go out there with helicopters? They put the shit on or whatever? They had the sheriff's I mean, the police, sure, yeah. They had the highway patrol. Uh, they had the federal people that take care of Death Valley. Well, I read about that. Uh, it doesn't have to Spawn's Ranch. I, could, I didn't know if Spawn's Ranch was, was done. Uh, L.A. County Sheriff's CHP. Oh, and I read it here in the paper. I figured right there. I'm a paper bug, you know, I read everything that comes in the paper. I read that and I said, I want this head to go with Charlie. I talked to Danny about it. Danny says, uh, uh, it did. But I didn't know, you know. Charlie <coughs> says that he left Swan Ranch because he had an argument with the old man that ran the place. And so he just left. Yeah, right. He's, Charlie got too much heat. And he figured when he went out to Death Valley, he wouldn't get as much heat. And they really put the heat on him out there. So. Charlie may have a new location in mind, but as far as Swan Ranch or Death Valley is concerned, no uh, he's just not going to meet there anymore. And once he gets another organization going, if he ever does someplace else, the same thing is going to happen. What's the chance of this Charlie getting out of jail? No chance for quite a while? Charlie has two years more to do on a federal rap. Oh, probation or what? Parole. Parole. He's going to be violated on that and he's going to join on that. The people in the district attorney's office in New York County have got something to file on us that damn well might take a year. I'm over and above the other two years. Who's your other partner? Mike McGinnis? Yeah. Al Springs. Al? 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 Let me shove this table down here. Yeah. Yeah. He just came in from Raymond with a piece of BS. What we've talked about so far is what he knows for a fact. And by fact, we're talking about what he hears from this guy Charlie Manson's mouth, what Charlie Manson has told him. Charlie Manson tells him that he makes his money by pulling residential robberies, go up to a house, knock on the door, stick a knife in the person's face, and take their money. Stick a knife in him when he goes in the door. <laughs> okay. Uh, he also takes the victim's blood and he writes things on the wall giving the inference of the Black Panthers and uh, What we're getting to now is talking about what Al here doesn't know for a fact but what he's heard. And I think the only way we can cover this are by the murders that you know about. Hinman we talked about. Hinman, the way you tell it, from information that you get from Clem. Well, let me tell you about this Hinman. I thought we'll save this because uh, I've got Danny pretty well talking to coming down here, and he knows, uh, I already, I didn't have to talk to him too hard to go down and talk to the Venice detectives. They know him most of his life. So he knows, uh, they know about it. Sooner or later he's got to confront you people. But right in his mind now, he doesn't know when Charlie's getting out of jail, how tight Charlie's uh, friends are behind him, or whatever. Like the two guys that got in his bread truck and was, to my opinion, his too, was going to probably put the shit to him. Because uh, he'd come back home and, uh, the shit was coming down and the girls got put in jail and the girls were talking and uh, Charlie got wind and a couple of his girls were in jail and they were doing some talking and when the shit started coming down Danny might do some talking we talked him into leaving the ranch and he tried to talk him into staying there so therefore keep Danny's ass out of hot water uh, Charlie assumed probably that uh, you know he'd uh, let it all hang off well I can get Danny down here and Danny can run down to you exactly the way he told it to me uh, in the Hinman case. He didn't tell me everything exactly, but I mean, you know, I really have to hear it from him because you get it. I'm not a little okay. static behind it. So the only thing that 
that you've heard then about the Hinman case besides Danny is what you've heard from Clint. Right, and that was just about cutting the air off and writing on the wall and the, and the thing and blaming it on the niggers and then that was it. But just a matter of a few words and after all this shit come down, Danny told me about the Hinman case and I just related back to hearing that sometime. I can't even remember the exact time I heard it, but uh, this is what really flashed my mind and I said, wow, that little bastard wasn't lying. <laughs> Okay. How about, uh, <clears throat> again, the death of this panther? The way that goes down is that Charlie was supposed to, he was buying a large quantity of dope, you know. Dope of some kind, uh, smuggling marijuana. From this panther. Yeah, right. And he goes to this panther's place to pay him off. There's a white guy standing at either side of a desk, and the panther's seated at the desk. Right. Charlie lifts out the gun and blows the guy up. Uh, after about five times the gun didn't go off, the guy, uh, he says, uh, the uh, colored guy stood up and says, you should come after me with a gun, eh? and the next one uh, wasn't so funny. So uh, apparently Charlie had went down there with the gun for protection with probably some of his friends, who we'll find out later, and uh, was going to try to make a deal with him on the money to keep all the Black Panthers from coming up to him. Charlie didn't know whether he was really going to do it or not. See, so. Uh, when it should come down and uh, things got a little heavy, uh, he had to pull his gun out and everybody just freaked. Now, who told you about that? Danny told me about it and Charlie told me about it. And who mentioned the gun? Who described uh, the gun? Danny described the gun and Charlie ran down the whole trip to me how he had done it and how funny it was. And uh, you ought to seen the look on their face. He, he, ha, ha. Was he waving the gun around when he was telling you about it? No, he didn't, I didn't. I never seen the gun. He didn't have the gun there. Danny just described the gun to me. Where did Danny get the information on the description of the gun? Well, Danny has been up, like I say, for two or three weeks, and uh, he's seen the gun. He's uh, uh, he knows Charlie. Charlie ran everything down to him. Probably as it happened. And uh, like Danny, every time anybody went after, he was always right there, day or night. So uh, whether he was implicated or not, it's not for me to say. But my impression is Danny. Uh, He's not that cool of a motherfucker to go out and uh, pull that kind of shit. Cold blood type murder. Right, he's not cold blooded. Or whatever's fair in, in this case. Give me the description out. of the gun again as Danny gives it to you. Danny gave me a description of the gun as uh, yeah, a long barrel, 22 caliber pistol, butt line or blunt line, or something of that nature. And uh, if you need an authority on gun, a good one. If you need to serve a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, he can, he'll run it down to you too. But anyway, it was a long girl, 22, nine round. Four or five actually went off, and on the fifth one, there must have been one in there because shit hit the fan. How about on Shorty's death? Where do you hear about that from? Uh, I heard about that from uh, Danny himself. He told me that the girls had told him about it. Did he say which girls? Uh, probably the one he was hung up on. Who was uh, that? Uh, the young one you have on Ventura County now. Uh, just told you about uh, Sherry? Sherry, yeah. Oh, Sherry. She wrote Danny a couple letters since she's been in there. And, uh, I guess she's talking. And this other girl, Kitty or Caddy or something like that, she not only probably has talked to you, but once she sees Danny, or on her own, from what he hears, he's going to just let it all hang out, too, you know. Everything she knows right to a T. So, uh, I figured I'd get the ball rolling because I don't want to see Danny get in trouble or something he didn't do. And if he did do it, it's a different story. What do you hear about the murder of Shorty? How that went down? Something about how Shorty had, uh, it was, it was really a lame duck in the first place. And he was real paranoid. And the shit started hitting the fan about all this stuff and people getting killed and uh, evidently uh, Charlie wanted him to go along and help him do the thing too. He wasn't going for it, so uh, they just put the shit to him. Well, did Danny tell you he was invited by Charlie to take care of Shorty? No, he didn't. He, uh, he told me about it, and I told him right to his face then and there. This is why I don't really believe he's lying. I said, well, the police are going to be found out about this. So I said, my father used to be an officer, and uh, I said, believe me, when shit starts coming down this heavy, and so much of it in such a big group, it really is happening. 
it's going to come out. And when it comes out, uh, if you're holding dirty, you're going. That's it. What was his reaction to that? Uh, he was real calm, but he was, uh, he was nervous about getting get himself killed by them the way Shorty did. But uh, I said, well, when shit comes down, you let them know everything and don't leave nothing out that you can think of. And whatever you do, don't tell no lies, because if you do, you're going to get crossed up here or there. Well, what did he have to say about Shorty's death, how he died? Was he shot? Uh, he was pretty well cut out his arms and his legs and his head. And Clem was ordered to go bury him by the hearsay that I've got from uh, Danny and, uh, well, Danny himself, really. Uh, the girl told Danny and Danny told me. And it really hurt Danny. He couldn't believe it. Uh, Charlie do that to one of his family, you know. The family's supposed to be so tight. Where were they supposed to have dumped him here? Well, uh, Clem was supposed to bury him. And in my mind, I feel uh, Charlie's got this place called Devil's Canyon. Told him in his pee, I said, I'm taking people up there. He even screws him down there by his tree where he hung his hair. He cut off the girls in the tree, you know, just sacrifice uh, their long hair and leave one little strand on for, uh, for his Devil's Canyon. He was the devil, see. And uh, I presume he was killed way down there. It would be a good place to kill somebody who's going to do it, I imagine. And maybe buried down there someplace. But you got this, Clem, or whatever. Myself or Danny could be put in the shitter with him to find out where he did put him. Under the impression that it's going to be stuck on, uh, on more of the other two or something like that. And he'd let it all go out and uh, let us know without letting you know, you know where the bodies were buried or whatever, so we could figure out some kind of story to put him in the clear. I don't know him that well. I met him a couple of times, and he was really a flake, so he stood there, malnutrition now, uh, dysentery, and well, what have you, in that fucking place. Now, how about the panther? Where was he supposed to have been? Without? He was supposed to have been uh, out in Griffith Park or some park up there. I don't know which park it was, but where he was killed, I don't know. I don't know where he was killed at. This again, you heard from who? I heard this from Danny, and I heard this from uh, Charlie, and uh, Texas just sat back grinning about it. And Clem was, yeah, yeah, boy, uh, uh, they sure fixed them. He didn't really say he did, he more like just said they. But, uh, What's the word rise mean to you? You ever hear that word? Rise. You don't think they? No, sunrise, sunset, or whatever. How about the word Delta Delta? Up for skelter, so I heard that on TV, you know, uh, pirate ship or whatever. That's the only time you heard it. Never heard it out of Charlie's mouth. Well, the way the, the words Charlie used in trying to con you, know, I heard all kinds of things that I probably can't think of, but that's his type of lingo, really. He really gets it. When, he, when he's amongst people that talk that way, you he expresses himself. He starts to tell you about something he did or something he's going to do or how he's going to go about doing it. Like, for instance, he's going to uh, get his things set up in this valley and uh, start killing a policeman by putting his little switch under there, turn the taillights off, and when the officer pull him over, if there was one, he'd come up to this side, and the guy in the back seat would be sitting here with a shotgun, the other guy in the back seat would be sitting here with a shotgun with the windows down. If there was two guys come up on both sides of the car, they just go, <laughs> see? Well, he's up on the floor sitting on a stump, standing up, running around, showing how he's going to do this and how he's going to do that. And he, he just, oh, he just ought to do this. Did Charlie have a car other than a dune buggy? If Charlie wanted to go into town, would he take the dune buggy? Uh, no. The two days that I was up there and could see the car, out of the two days, you know, that the, the, the car was there, out there, out there uh, probably about three days, maybe all together, just off and on. But uh, the two days, this girl, with, uh, this pregnant girl with red hair, she had some kind of a beef gun. She was driving Charlie all around in a Volvo, a white Volvo. Volvo, Volvo, yeah. Did Charlie take a motor into town? Uh, I rode Danny's bike on several occasions to pick up girls. They seemed right on Chopper, you know. What kind jump of on the bank. What bike has Danny got? You know, orange colored 80, 7480, an old. Maybe 34 model. What do you You know, it's a three wheel 45 as a yeah. lady. Well, it's a, it looks like a pregnant 45 engine. <coughs> big, big Harley Davidson 74 flathead. You know, it's an old Danny's old pride and joy. It falls apart twice a week. He puts it back together with glue, but it runs. 
What color were the dune buggies up there that you saw? Um, one of those sort of a reddish primer. Danny's a big one. Oh. Uh, have a dark red. Red? Red. And, uh, you just put together this fresh pipe and all kinds of, uh, what's that chicken screen mesh? Well, it's tied and wired for a full boy, both of them like that. Nothing blue or purple, huh? Let's put it in the box. Three or four of them, we have to see. They're the ones that had stashed out. Would he take a dune buggy into town? Mm, no, no place on them. No place on them, no. See, those dune buggies are supposed to be bought at some place. He's coughing and spitting and sputtering. He's pulling something out of the carburetor. He'd go right to it, pull it out, fix it, put it back in. He's like, no. How old was this guy? 28, 29, maybe. Is he tall, short? Uh, a little shorter than I am. Maybe he's about 5'8, maybe 140, 45. Not a heavy guy. No, black hair. Long, short? I'll be going to get his name. He was uh, regular hair. Yeah. About like mine. You have a name on his uniform? No, but I can get his name. What color was the uniform? Uh, blue. That mechanics blue? Yeah, I've heard of mechanics blue. I've seen a lot of Volkswagen mechanics, and I can't really describe the exact color, but uh, it's a regular Volkswagen mechanics uh, uniform. Anything you want to get in on this? No, yeah, please. I want to ask about this. <clears throat> when you kill this color, this panther, supposedly. When, was, when did this take place, you know? Uh, this I can tell you. I can, I can find out. And, uh, like, I want to bring Danny down here and have Danny run this down. When can you get Danny down? Uh, it's a good possibility I can bring him down on. Today? Tomorrow. I can bring him down today. I imagine it. Maybe. Now, if he's there, he's, he's got just him and his kid, and his dad's setting up a shop, and uh, he's running back and forth carrying machinery and this and that and everything else, and he's got a babysitter for the kid. And, uh, I couldn't find him this morning, otherwise I'd try to get him to come down here. Where's his wife? Uh, I don't know. Did uh, she leave him? Crazy Indian out on a wolf pass someplace. I think she's in Arizona. She's got property on a reservation out in uh, one of those towns out in Arizona someplace. What did you know? Was it, was it this year? Uh, 69. You don't know what part of 69? No, I don't. This is all hearsay from from them to me, but straight from Charlie, and it hasn't been too long ago. I recall hearing something about either it in the paper or else it, it just seemed like I did on account. I've heard so much about it from them people. you know where this guy was shot? Did they say where, where he got shot? No, but I caught the body. Yeah, right in the heart area. Right in the chest. This is what Charlie says? Right. He says, he says I'm going to click, 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 and the guy says, ha, ha, I got it. How dare you bring a gun in here on me? And he goes, Bam. It was all over the dump on him. You think they'd go as far as to crush his head? When they get ready to dump him? Was that ever mean? I wouldn't doubt it, but uh, they were throwing tools down the bush that they claimed they pulled. Everything they told me sounded phony. Then this shit started really coming up, really clicking, man. And, uh, I got to thinking to myself, uh, no good. This this place up in Devil's Canyon is the accessible to us in a vehicle, or are we going to have to horseback it? No, I can run you up there in a vehicle, and I can take you for a little walk, and uh, I want to wear my dress slacks, but uh, not that heavy. The girls all did it barefoot. You can get in there in a four-wheel drive Jeep with no strings. I don't know which way they did it, but he had his new buggy down there, and he got it stuck once. Is there a place to run horses down there? You would never get it done in this weather, not that rain and that shit up there. Shit, you think that thing would be actually... Hmm. What why not? Wants to be a place to run horses. Yeah, you ran horses as far as we ran to ride down in there. But uh, I don't know the exact way to get down in there. Bob, well, the people who lived back there ran them off the first night, and they snuck back in the back way because they had all the grill staffs down there. And uh, I walked down there. And by the time I got down there, Charlie was already there with a doom buddy, but it was stuck in the big bed. But you've never been in the bottom of that canyon before? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a trip for you. Listen, did you ever see this? You never saw this gun, I think you said. 
No, uh, Danny has, and he's a, uh, I can check his record, he's an expert on guns from the service, and he knows what he's talking about. Except the only thing he doesn't know about the gun is whether it was a cold or whether it was a high standard or whether it was a whatever. Was there any mention of where Charlie got the gun? No. Probably find that out, Phil. I think you said here earlier about something about the, the murders that uh, Charlie City is involved in. I've been sitting here saying it's been involved in a bunch of them. Well, but I mean, uh, I mean four or five at one time. Yeah, and uh, on approximately the 12th or the 13th, when I was up there, he was, they'd come in and they talked about the other night, they didn't say what night, but just the other night, a couple nights ago or whatever, they had uh, gotten four or five of them at one time, you know, sliced them all up or whatever. And, uh, and what month was this? Uh, it was around August uh, 12, 13, something like that. It was Ernest Thomas. And they, they just pulled a deal like this, right. they, where they killed four or five people. Right. So the, the Venice detectives were uh, asking me questions. I agreed to you know, help them and put it on tape or whatever. I was not even going to court on it. I don't give a fuck and I ain't worried about it. Cause, uh, just like I told him a while ago, I had assumed already Charlie ain't getting out. You know, people that I know that he knows, uh, to me they're just, just so lame anyway. They're probably scared to come into town. But anyhow, they were asking about a blue Camaro. And I don't know what you know about a blue Camaro, but maybe what I tell you, what I know about one might help. Okay. Danny was running down on the dentist detectives that time. Uh, well, they did. I mean, I didn't know anything then. I've been just digging away and finding all kinds of things out. So. Uh, I got Danny home and said, Danny, I'm to the level of me now. Beyond a reasonable doubt, I just don't let anything slide. You told them the exact truth about this blue Camaro? He says, yeah. I said, well, what was, the, what was the guy like? He said, well, he was a beer commercial. He took care of these beer commercials, whatever, uh, in the studios. And uh, he wanted Danny to uh, be in one of his commercials. But if you just saw Danny then, uh, his little hat on, he's all drunk and his beard, and his, he, was, he was like a little old wine or drunk or whatever, he just said good one of them old funny beer commercials. And the guy was supposed to be taking care of beer commercials such as slits or hams or something about the ice cold water and that be hands. And he had a blue Camaro with a black top and Danny's mother and father are supposed to be able to verify this too. Well, the guy, he uh, hung out at Spahn's Ranch and him and Charlie blipped back and forth. This was all about the same time. And uh, I don't know what the area of the town the guy lives in, but I can find it. I know I can find it. Well, see, I work with the Reaper Desert. And uh, they both live out in the valley. And if one Reaper Desert happens to know Charlie, I'm just running across them. And uh, somehow or other, the Reaper Desert's uh, wife knows this guy to handle these beer commercials and the whole shit. I just got it all out of them. I told them up as well. Uh, we sold them a motorcycle and Danny was arrested on one, which that's where the courts prove we can prove it on paperwork and Danny's innocent of it. So uh, I run it down to them and uh, we sold it to this guy. And, just, and uh, he's got the registration, uh, not the registration, but the bill of sale. And Danny was put in jail for the motorcycle. Well, we got to find the guy because when we find the guy and produce that that uh, bill of sale with Danny's regular, uh, regular signature on it, I'll get Danny off the hook. So the guy's just bending over backwards to help me out, but he doesn't know anything about this thing. He's just a stone citizen. He knows the guy. And uh, uh, he can get me the name, the address, and everything. As a matter of fact, I wrote something down about it. A-T-O-L-L, in the valley, between Roscoe and Satterkoy, in the 7900 block, has a blue Camaro with a black top. His name's either Art or Al. There's a small row where I'm sitting in my office, and uh, this guy comes walking in. I just stop. Uh, you live out in the valley, you get a bounce of tang. Do you ever know a fellow named Charlie? All the girls. You mean Charlie Manson? I said, yeah. I said, wow, hey, you know, something else. Uh, uh, 
it was in my mind. So I get all this information straight now, and I'll fix you up with uh, that, and uh, he ain't going to be too happy with me probably turning you on to, on to him and get him involved, because I know, oh. he's, I know he's innocent. Well, you can talk to him, you know, it's, that's, that's your prerogative. We'll be nice with that. But when this shit comes down, uh, uh, all this information I'm getting, these guys are going to call me a backstabber. But here's, here's my thing on that. So, the only way his people are going to know that we have this information is murder. You tell them. You tell them. You know, we're not going to drop your name to anybody oh, anytime. So, any, if anybody finds anything out, it's nothing to come from any of us. Well, see, all the people I know and uh, associates I have and everything can say, well, I'm a marijuana bust or this or that or whatever. The guy's a snitch. <laughs> uh, somebody says, if somebody says to me, uh, you know, I snitched on something like this. I said, you know what? I'll bust your fucking neck, man. You call me a snitch when I, I'm talking to somebody out on a murder. Do you realize what murder is? Well, there's 11, you know, 11 people that murdered. Right. See, That's this true. is the thing, man. And if I can stop him, it's, it's just like, it's one of these incidents where here's a guy standing here, and a guy pulls up, pulls a gun out, and blam, blam on the street. There's you know, 50 people over here. Read the license number, see the guy's description, and everybody's turning around, splitting, and want to get involved. That's what everybody's been doing, man. Everybody's been, you know, I keep hearing about this and hearing about this and uh did you connect up the, <laughs> the four or five people that uh, charlie said they, they killed in early august with any particular crime right the take crime if, if you put that together you put right this is what i put together and i put this together after we had uh talked to the best detectives see all this shit come down well here's the thing i got i got myself involved and uh, victim of circumstances type deal and where uh, I'm not even implicated except I was just uh, I was just there. Uh, the Venice Police Department, they tell me that they'll, uh, they'll talk to the district attorney and uh, get my cases either dropped or whatever. Or I thought we'd go ahead and check it out because, you know, uh, I know what I've done, I know what I haven't done. I've been holding dirty. I make sure I keep myself clean when the shit comes down and I'm not claiming to be no angel. And that's for goddamn sure. It would be not a lot of light if I wasn't. So uh, they said, they know this, they know that. And I said, well, look, regardless of that, when it comes to murder, uh, I don't have to sit here and say to you, if you let me out to look for this, I'll give you information for that. Well, I'm going to give you information for that anyway. So, he didn't make a deal on that case. And then this other case come up, and uh, the one I put together. Mm -hmm. The case that you had, that you're talking about now, or the take deal? Well, that was just going to be any mercy on my uh, little penny in the case. On, this, uh, on some of these murders that Charlie pulled off. Then in comes the take case thing puts us all together. And, uh, well, my son died two Saturdays ago, and all this bullshit comes down. I just, you know, I couldn't get anything together, and all. I got arrested. I got put in jail. I took every cent I had to get out of jail. And one of my best friends at Deaf Mute put up his house and his car and everything to get me out of the goddamn slammer. And uh, then my kid dies, and I uh, said, so fuck it, you know, that's more like a stand. So I'm just now getting back together again. When you were down there on the 11th, did the, did the conversation of the murders of the Tate come up? No, uh, by Manson or anything. Just, uh, just victims such as uh, we had gotten, uh, we had gotten four or five of them at uh, either one time or in one night. Or that impression. See. At that particular time, did you right. put two and two together and say? No, uh, the because uh, I had no idea then. I thought it was just bullshit me. Did any of these people wear glasses? They were talking well, I've been thinking on that too. If anybody wore glasses, uh, it would have been the guy that was driving the car if anything ever come to that. Because uh, nobody else I saw wore glasses. If they did, in that rough terrain, uh, they'd never keep them very long anyway. You didn't see anybody up there with, in that group no. with glasses then? No, Danny met this guy that was supposed to be in the commercialist. And me getting up from Danny after I. Uh, the police of Venice asked me, do I know anything about the Blue Camaro? And that was just it, the Blue Camaro. I hit on Danny. Danny didn't recall it right away. So we go to the police department, and Danny runs it down to them. Oh, yeah, wow, wow. Uh, Danny hit on me to do beer commercials. And, uh, yeah, I gave my mother and father's address and everything, and he wanted me to go to work for him. And, and I said, well, I'll see what I can do about this. It looks kind of thin. I don't think I can even do anything about it. So I get out of the office where I work part-time at the Able Auto Justice Repossession, and uh, I'm sitting down there, and in comes this guy and lives out in the valley. Bob is his film. Uh, you up around there quite a bit. Uh, what do you know about this? we got to find a guy now and get that uh, bill of sale back. I mean, Dan, Dan, Danny goes to jail about 18 months. Oh, I'll be glad to help. I'll be glad to help. You know, there you go.
But I was the other blue car. I said, you know what I was a blue canal? Yeah. Now, as myself, as him, the repossessor, the guy I work with part time, I don't know how police look for cars and colors and shades. And when I get on the street, every car that passes me is not going too fast. I've got the license number off, I'll say. I've got the color, the description, the kind of tires, the people in it. You're just looking for it. Steady. Let me ask you this question. When somebody like Tex is working on a, on a car, have you ever seen a guy kind of squint or look like uh, maybe at one time he wore glasses and he could use a pair now, but he hasn't got them and he's having a little bit of trouble seeing the fine part? Tex gave me the impression that, like I said before, he was a college student, real clean cut, and, yeah, you know, I think he could wear glasses. Definitely he could wear glasses. Did he ever appear to you to have trouble seeing? Uh, on a whole bunch of different occasions. We about took the dune buggy over three or four different times. We ran into a culvert. We ran through a barbed wire fence. And uh, when we went to park it in the little stall, he about ran me right off the cliff and almost killed both of us. Why? Because he just, uh, I thought he was, I, thought, I just thought he was nuts. <laughs> you know, he's putting the person revving it up, <laughs> this and that, and spinning circles and going like, I saw all this, and I how you get in a dune buggy, and you come right up to a cliff, and psh, you fly off, and like rat patrol, you're off, you're, you're in the air, you know, this is, he's showing off to me. And uh, I don't know if that was from vision or just from showing off. But anyway, the white guys are still crazy as, crazy as Charlie, but real clean, real distinguished looking. How long have you known this text? Oh, uh, two or three days. Time, the length of time I was up there. Just from the 12th of August? Yeah, and then approximately from, uh, uh, Possibly the, my, it could even be the 11th, uh, see I'm saying that on these days, I don't know. Uh, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, or 12th, 13th, 14th, and definitely the night, the night of the 15th. The text was nowhere around uh, that night. He come up, it seemed like he was there, but he split. Yeah, Charlie was there for a while, and uh, he got in the wind, then he came back. So I think he went on. The reason these other guys weren't around is uh, he told us they got a gun over there and a gun over here, and you guys start fucking up. He says, uh, we're going to start blowing you away. The guys just kept on fucking things up anyway. Nobody got blew away. You never saw Charlie walking around with a gun on him. Mm -hmm. Knife only. This thing was knife. He's a knife freak. How about the rest of the guys? Do they, uh, they carry guns or knives? Or no, they uh, they all carried some kind of a knife. Why do you suppose Charlie didn't take a knife when he went to see that panther rather than a gun? Oh, he had a knife. Another guy was supposed to have had the fucking gun from what I hear. And I have Danny run it down to you too. Uh, the guy didn't have the guts to do it or something and Charlie grabbed the gun. You know, two guys here, and the panther here. Charlie probably didn't want to waste his time with a, with a, getting a knife out and going through all the fucking extra hassle or whatever. It seemed like it was his bag to start butchering people, but uh, they could have had a knife or a gun or something in the drawer and put the shit to that right there. What kind of a knife does he use? Carried on. Uh, I guess he was uh, small, not a knife about this long, yet tied to a sheath in the back of his uh, leather. Uh, his whole pants were all leather, brown leather. Friend sure was hanging on. This is Charlie. He had sent a little moccasins on. And the knife was right down here so he could like, scratch his leg. And, and uh, just that quick, he had it out and throw and he could stick it almost anywhere he wanted to. How long a blade do you think this knife that he used? Oh, it, had, it had a blade about this long. Uh, <coughs> between six and eight inches? Oh, uh, about like that. The that average, was the blade thing? Yeah, the blade thing. Was, all it does the knife might have been that long. How and about this long. Maybe. And was it, uh, what was his description? How would you describe the blade? Uh, just a average, uh, average blade. Mm -hmm. Then he had that cutlass, too. He does a picture of that cutlass on here. The blade's about as wide as a book of matches and does. I ain't sure about the, I ain't sure about the hand on this hunting knife. But anyway, uh, the blade. But it more or less was uh, one of these kind like this. It might have been a little fatter down here. I don't know if it had the blood groove in it or whatever. Regular hunting knife then. Regular hunting knife, yeah. You ever see any funny looking knives up there? It's a knife that looks different. Uh, do they make really carry them? No. When they're all throwing knives. Uh, they all had just, to me, it was just the average hunting knives. Knives ain't my bag, and uh, no, I didn't ever pay no mind to him except he's, oh, he's got a knife and he's stoned it this way, he's stoned it this way, he's stoned it this way, he's seen how fast he can get it out of here and throw it like that. And 
You never saw anybody with an unusual looking hunting knife. No. Something out of the ordinary. Just a buck of cutlass he had. Nothing kind of weird either way he was sashaying around with. It. You think you can come up with that for us, huh? I think I can come up with that. I really do. Uh, either one of either one of the guys in the club's got or uh, one of the slaves might have it. How'd they get it away from Charlie? Uh, when we was all up there, uh, we just, well, we just boom, right on in there. A few of us was on bikes. Like I said, I was driving that 60 Oldsmobile. And uh, on the way up there, while I was driving the Oldsmobile, this fellow, uh, Robert uh, Reed, <coughs> picked up on a warrant check. He ran to jail the night. Well, there, there you go, right there. Robert Reed, Robert, Robert Reed was arrested on a warrant. And less than 10 minutes after that, we was there, along with a couple other carloads. Where about was he arrested? He was arrested on uh, Topanga Boulevard, just a couple miles, or a mile, mile and a half, two miles, approximately, away from uh, Ventura Boulevard. Were you there when he was arrested? I'm driving the car. Was it LAPD? Uh, sheriff's. Whoever the, whoever the sheriff's are, I it was LAPD. It was? Must have been, because they had a warrant in Los Angeles. Was it a black was uniform? It? Yeah. The police dark, had? dark blue. They they took old Robert Reed away right there. Was it a motorcycle or? Uh, it, was all, it was all in the car. You mean the policeman? Huh? Oh, he was the notice of the car. R-E-E-D, R-E-I-D. R-E-E-D. Call Venice Police Department and say, uh, Robert Reed, and uh, every one of them will say, yeah? <laughs> they know what <it's> <coughs> This is the first time the Venice Police Department got a chance to know me out of the four years I've been there. You ever seen any, when you're up there, uh, junk laying around the place, any rope? Rope. Yeah, they used all kinds of rope. I can't describe it, but they lived underneath. Uh, well, I describe it more or less as a uh, parachute rope. Bullshit like that in that order, because they had they lived under a parachute and bullshit like that, not on a rope, that kind of stuff. Not on a rope and binder twine, and you know that kind of bullshit. Any nylon rope that was bigger than the parachute cord? Well, I can't really say for sure, but they had all kinds of fucking rope. They had everything tied up. They had all kinds of shit tied. At one time, tied on dune buggies and tied in that tree. I'll show you the tree in the parachute deal. Where I, I don't know if the parachute might still be there yet. And uh, everything they did was uh, crude. You know, done with tied together with ropes or uh, used knives for cutting up this or that or rocks for crushing this or that or whatever. He acted like he wanted to go back to the Stone Age, more or less. You know. As an animal, he had everything to the tail. <coughs> Did you ever hear of a guy named Dominic Rossi? No. Dora Pissus? Sharon Ransom? Oh, Sherry. Is that, is that the girl, the young girl? Might be, might not. I don't, well, know. I don't know. See, most all these people run around with these uh, nicknames and this bullshit. Uh, Danny, the, the three, three and a half weeks or whatever it was, just full time up there. I don't know exactly, I can't recall exactly how long he was there all the time. But it was all around this whole bullshit. That's why, you know, I got Danny's ear. I said, Danny, you going to do the thing. You get up there now because if you don't, in regards to what I go down here for anything I go, sooner or later it's going to crack. When it cracks, it'll come get you. And uh, so he can be able to help you out a lot on this. A guy named Lenny. Lenny. Leonard? No. I know Lenny uh, rides the motorcycle down to Rihanna Beach, but he, I don't, he don't even know these people. Did you discuss the uh, Tate case or did Denny with the uh, Venice detectives? Uh, just what I put together myself. Denny had no uh, no reaction, even to me when we were talking personally at the house about the Tate case. Oh, yeah, really, really? And I mentioned the fact that uh, there was. Uh, reward put in the paper and uh, Danny was uh, he said look he, says, he didn't want his kid he says you know he gave out information but he didn't want his kid killed just over a lousy fucking twenty five or fifty thousand dollars you know I said well you know what uh, I says uh, my son if anything I said I could sure use it I says irregardless of whether I could use it or not I put everything up front uh, whether I had it or whether I hadn't had it where did you hear how much the reward was if there was uh, the guy I worked with part time uh, uh, I said, boy, this uh, tape case is really something, isn't it? He says, yeah. I says, any information leading to that? He says, they got a hell of a reward out for it. I says, how much? He says, 25000 or uh, 50000 or something like that. I says, oh, really? Yeah. It was clammed up. I didn't think anything. What's his name? Uh, Larry Thomas. He lives on the valley also. 
he works for this Able Auto. Yeah, he works for Able Auto Adjusters, and part time does park cars and drive cars and deliver cars for him. Goes out repossessing cars. That's what I was doing last night, the night before last. The night before last was when I got this information on this blue car, and it wraps all around Charlie, and it's uh, run down to me by two different people that didn't even know each other that are so far apart and now. Uh, uh, One's a citizen, one's a motorcycle rider, and distance of living and everything else. It just click, 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 you know. My mind just drove it on. I said, something's got to be there. Now, I know there's something there, whether they borrowed the car, or the guy was there, or he wore the glasses, or Tex wore the glasses, or, or somebody uh, was on their way out the door and shot the guy in the car, or whatever. Well, do you think you can get the car load back here today? Uh, I ain't going to say today, because his father, uh, well, I don't know the address, but you can check with the benefit tax if they, they know exactly where it's going. Nice. Good chance in it, yeah. I'll tell you what. We'll if not, I can give you a call. So we'll stay close. Early in the morning. Okay, we'll stay close to the office today and wait to hear from you today. See if you can't get him in this afternoon. If not, tonight. And if not, the first thing tomorrow morning. That is not tomorrow, Friday. We'd like to get the property before the weekend. Yeah. Do you think you can do it? Well, uh, I know I have to work tonight, and I, I want to need the money, so I don't know if I'm okay, I got the fast setup. But uh, how's tomorrow? Maybe I can still go ahead and arrange it for tonight. But uh, well, if I go to work, it'll be uh, probably nine, ten o'clock. If I go to work, the thing is, uh, sleeps into the house too, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get to sleep. Go to work. How's tomorrow? You gotta work at 10 o'clock with uh, I, I deliver, like, see, I'm supposed to be delivering cars right now. And, uh, I didn't get the boss a tow bar and told him to go ahead and tow me the tow bar because I had to go downtown and see my lawyer. And, uh, it was alright. Uh, I just, what's tomorrow afternoon? Did you get a chance to get some sleep? Yeah, I'm sure. No sleep. Well, I sleep most of the night. I'm, I'm sitting back here sleeping in the car and, uh, he's driving around when he comes across the car he's gotta have, uh, he wakes me up. He woke me up twice last night in a relaxed dinner call, so we had to call it Barnum, Barnum, Barnum Towing and have him come tow the cars away. They woke me up for nothing. But, uh. Okay, let's figure on tomorrow afternoon that way you're going to get a little sleep. Yeah. You think you can drop Danny into tomorrow afternoon? Uh, I'm pretty sure I already had him talked into it, but, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't locate him today. I don't know what the fuck he was doing. That give you enough time to get a hold of him part yeah. of the day and tomorrow? Alright, let's figure on the. Tomorrow afternoon, you can give us a call. And it, uh, tomorrow afternoon, let's do it Friday morning. Yeah, I was under impression, Mike, about just the time limit involved and everything on this on this case. Uh, I think it's been pretty hard to get a hold of us until now, until all this bullshit comes up. But uh, get right down to it. Uh, how about this uh, money problem he was talking about? I mean, the reward? Yeah. There's a $25,000 reward. See, I threw out, I threw out everything I knew to the full limit of the benefit taxes before we even started putting this tape thing together. Uh, I just, I got the kind of complex that, uh, I want to see justice done to its full extent um, when it comes to murder. Like I say, I ain't no, uh, no fucking angel. I bet you, uh, might want to try to be, you know, everybody takes their changes, but, uh, I've been shit on all my life. My father was an officer for quite a few years, and he wound up in jail last year. No, that's a well, uh, we have there's twenty five thousand dollars reward money. And, uh, investigating officers, which we are, have to say as to who gets the money, who's provided the information. Of course, it's you're the one that's, that has come to us. Well, it's like this, uh, you know, money or no money, I'd go all the way. But still, if the information proves uh, reliable and uh, they are the people involved, why the money? Is, as far as I can see, your money is money. I never, my whole life, I never had over five hundred dollars at one time. My kid died. I got a wife and three kids at home now, and I'm sitting here now with ten dollars in my pocket until uh, my boss cashes this check. Now they probably give me another forty or fifty, and that's about it. Got a lawyer to pay and all this bullshit. Uh, well, let's I want to see the case crack first. You know. Put it on the basis <laughs> for now. Uh, what you say here sounds good, and it makes good sense. But as far as I'm concerned, it's an opening. You can get the car back here, and there's two of you want to sit down, and we'll do some serious talking at the end and go over this uh, and see what from this information what we can get. And when we've got enough and it's solid and it's firm, uh, then 
people have that. And I hope no one in the world will ever make you want you to learn. Uh, I will say this, is that possibility of 25 grand that this thing can get split more than one more. This stand right now looks like you and Carlo. You can come up with enough solid stuff. I think when Carlo comes down here, if uh, he's honest and he's innocent, if not me, you would say, uh, I think he's going to put your old head in the front of the ceiling. He's going to be saying, wow. Well, uh, let me be honest with you. That is, that there's, there's a lot of what sounds like great information here. Somebody else might come along tomorrow and be able to go point, 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 and just lay it all out. But somebody on this item that was found with the same for the murder, and they can lock it all up. But that's what it's going to be. I don't think it can really, because I know where that knife was at. A year and a half or two years ago, I've seen that knife all over the place. It's been in a club for a long time, but it won't miss them. That knife was taken up there, and that was his pride and joy. He loved that fucking old cutlass thing. And uh, besides that, after all this bullshit, the way I've been putting together my own mind is, bam, this was said to me by an entirely different person, not even brought up the subject, you just popped out of thin air. Somebody started rapping about it. Boom, way over here, and the guy don't even know the other guy. Boom, wow, hey, this motherfucker's a killer, man. He's a stolen, star raven fucking idiot. You know, like this car, maybe to you it doesn't, uh, you might have information on it already, on this blue Camaro, probably have, but uh, when it started hitting me at two different people at two different angles, and it all comes up the same, something's up, something, somebody's shit in the wood patch. Well, maybe we can get a bit. ask you one thing before we go, what kind of a setup for the squirrel was it supposed to be with the Panther for narcotics? Uh, he was supposed to, Charlie was supposed to have scored, well, I would say approximately a thousand dollars or whatever. Danny can run it down to you about marijuana or whatever from him. And uh, somehow or other there was a burn deal set up where um, one of them was probably was going to burn the motherfucker. And uh, the guy wasn't going for it, and he was supposed to take the Black Panther brothers and go up there and really put the shit on the uh, spawn movie we around. So Charlie went down to uh, have a little chat with him. And throughout the chat, somehow uh, things got out of hand, and uh, I guess the guy got lifted with Charlie, and being Charlie was backed up by his friends, compadres, or whatever. He wasn't going to take the shit. And so the burn had already taken place then. Uh, and evidently it has. I'm not, not saying it has. But it's going to go back up. Well, the burn must have been taking place or else this one will come down. Yeah. Okay. What is logical? All right. You'll give us a call sometime today and let us know whether we're set for tomorrow afternoon or we're set for Friday morning. Is that fair enough? Okay. Definitely. I'll call you, uh, I'll call you tomorrow. Uh, well. What time do you mean you're up? Maybe tomorrow sometime in the morning or afternoon. Why don't you call us today or this evening? We're here till 5. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. If we're not I'll here... I'll let you go between 9 and 5 because I will round you up between 9 and 5. If we're not here, leave word and uh, that you're coming in tomorrow afternoon at a certain time or you're coming in Friday morning or you couldn't get a hold of him and you'll keep trying and call us tomorrow. If I'm late, if you go to the 16 I'll show you how boy, it's just on the rag. <laughs> Battery was coming dead this morning and... Uh, left A-frame is all bent and you let go of the steering wheel and it takes off this way of the road. I got to stay in a slow lane on the power steering keeps it on the, uh, I'm sitting even driving it. Christ, I have no way to get around. Well, but there's McGann, that's a patch of my guitars. Okay. Well, if you want to go on your excursion out there, let me know uh, almost any day and all this rain probably has wrecked them out there. Right? Because, you know, if we could have got out there before it rained, you could have done a lot of, a lot of work probably. A lot of bullshit. Yeah. Maybe the water will water I don't know. the body. Can you, uh, go horse back right now? Oh, certainly. All right. Anytime we're ready to go. Yeah, I've never been on a horse. Just a motorcycle. If you think I'm old on a motorcycle, you better get my horse. You get some dirt bikes and you get your horse back. I'll take my bike down. I, gotta, I made it into a freeway. Thanks. Okay, Al, we'll be in touch and we'll see how things go. Okay. All right. Hope it goes with it. Benefit my mind both ways, justice and the other too. Before you get out of here, look at this thing. Have you ever seen a skull like that around that ranch? Yeah, I've seen them around here. Yeah, they're pretty Charlie, when I was up there, Charlie's hair was 
all comes down, hanging in his face, and uh, he shaved everything off, and uh, his little bristles all sticking out, and he was, uh, he was all sunburned, and he was just kind of a hard guy to, you know, just to stick out. If I could see him, I could, if he put a hundred guys in the row, I'd say, there he is. Like, picture right there, right there, uh, every girl down the street. <laughs> all right. Call us then, will you? I'll do that. Okay.